What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Astoria Filmmakers Club podcast, all known as the AFC podcast. I am your host, Phil Capadora, the founder and current president of the Astoria Filmmakers Board. Uh, we're very, oh, I totally goofed on that, but we're keeping that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Astoria Filmmakers Club, chairman of the board, all that good stuff. Uh, we do have some uh, new uh, board team members, so be prepared for the announcement. Be sure to follow us on our social media. And thank you so much for your subscription and uh, your comments here on our YouTube channel. We got a great, actually a really great podcast lined up. I'd like to introduce all of you to a New York City firefighter, now actor. He goes by the name of... JJ Barra the third, but for this episode, we're just going to call him Joe Barra. Welcome to the AFC podcast, buddy. Thank you so much for having me, my friend. It's a pleasure. Awesome, man. All right. So it's just like, you know, this is uh, exciting for me. It's our first episode back off of summer break. Uh, kids are now going back to school and all that stuff. Uh, how was your summer? Summer was incredibly busy, but it was a great kind of busy. So I really can't complain. Good, good, good. I wish I could relate. Um, I wish there was more things that we could have done to get ahead. We got our uh, season three of the uh, Triborough Film Festival we're currently in pre-production for, and uh, it's actually really exciting. Um, two years ago, uh, it was around September of 2022, and I only had one submission uh, for season one of the Triborough Film Festival at this time. And as of today, we got 32. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, and it's like, thank God, because like I knew word of mouth and just consistency was going to be key, but I could not be more thankful that we've developed such a nice reputation and catered to the New York City filmmaking community the way we have in the last two years. And uh, season three is actually a phenomenal lineup. I'm actually like, like, I, like I, I, I'm really impressed by these directors and writers because they actually are story first. And it's just for me, inspiring to actually get a chance to work with these guys on their net on their next project. Wow. That's incredible, man. So happy for you guys. Thank you so much. So without further ado, Joe, let's talk about you for a minute. Um, I read in your bio, uh, that, uh, you grew up or were raised in the Hudson Valley, but you decided after some s serious setbacks to become, uh, one of New York city's bravest. So actually, yes. Um, there's a lot more to that. I will be a future firefighter, not currently in yet. I'm set to go into the academy in January next year. Uh, and congratulations. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. But I'll tell you, and I know you've read it in my bio, this all came about after an intense three and a half year storm in my life, which all of us go through. But I always tell people, instead of just going through the troubles, because we all have them, don't go through the trouble, grow through the trouble. And of course, I know you're going to ask me more about this later, but I credit my faith, my dedication to God and Christ, putting them first at my lowest moments to what got me through and to actually credit them with all the blessings I have going on right now. I couldn't be more grateful. Well, why don't we talk about day one? Uh, was there sort of like uh, uh, the book of Joe in your case that kind of was the inciting incident three and a half years ago that kind of set you on this path? So the inciting incident, which is an inciting incident for probably millions of people out there and probably for a lot of those listening, was a breakup. Yes, it was a breakup. There we um, go. Uh, she, so we dated a brief story because trust me, I can go into big detail, but we yeah. dated four and a half years. It was a long distance relationship. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. She was living here in New York. And I was very upfront and honest about what I was doing. I was, I graduated college. I was an actor living in Los Angeles, which I know sounds great to a lot of people, but she signed up. She's like, no, I love you. We're going to make this work. So flash forward to four and a half years later, I'm still in LA because the thing that held us together and this is the key with long distance relationships, little tips for you all out there. You have to have an end date. You have to say, I, this distance will be shut at X date. We never had that. All I told her was yeah. I would eventually be moving back to New York. And as always, like 2020 was an interesting year for a lot of people. 2020, before the pandemic, I told her I committed it to being my last year living 
in Los Angeles, and then I would move to New York. So the groundwork was set. October, shipped most of my stuff back to my home in New York, my family's home. November comes around of 2020. We're talking about our life together, finally closing this distance, how great life's going to be. I have her Christmas gifts order. She has mine. And then it was November 30th, 2020. Yeah, 2020. I'll never forget. I was helping a buddy of mine move. It was about a two and a half hour drive. I was driving one of the big U-Hauls. You know, they have different sizes. Happened to be the biggest size. Thank God I was by myself because during that drive, she broke up with me on the phone. Oh, and if, no. Yeah. And I did not see it coming. Completely blindsided. And for you ladies out there, she told me that she was hinting at, you know, signs that things were wrong. We are men. We are stupid. After four and a half years, we don't take <laughs> hints. Like, just tell us. Because yeah. completely blindsided me. I, th by the grace of God, as I was being emotionally destroyed, driving that big U-Haul with one hand and in the other hand, holding my phone on speaker, because as you know, most U-Hauls don't have Bluetooth. Yeah. I didn't crash. I didn't hit anybody. Thank God. But yeah, it was like my life felt at the time it couldn't have been better. I was on cloud nine. Um, I was just coming off of my first feature film as well. So excited to move back to New York and then as I was running through life at 200 miles an hour, the day, at day when she broke up with me, I hit a brick wall and I was lost. So that's what started this storm. And, you know, you never, you always think the storm's over, but it's not. You always no. go through. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many times where I'm like, all right, that's it. It's done. I'm good. I'm going to, this is it. Now I'm on the up and up. No. There's always other tests, other trials. Something. Yeah. Yep. Wasn't easy. But yes, that was the catalyst. Jeez, man. It's... No, I, I could totally relate because uh, my wife and I uh, got married in 2016, uh, right before the Olympics in Brazil, went on our honeymoon in Brazil. Great story about uh, Brazil. I love that country. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful place. I love their um, steakhouses. Oh, I like Fogo de Chão? Oh, I love Fogo. Big fan. I, I, there, uh, I'm, t I'm talking to, um, I'm talking to a stuntman uh, right now. Shout out Luca. He actually works at Manhattan Folk with the Show. Well, sounds like we have to pay him a visit. Yeah, I'm sure he got. I'm sure he's got friends and family discounts. And if for the acting community, you need a buffet, bro. I'm just oh, saying. Oh, what I love, it. Bu I love buffets. Oh my gosh. But well, as you were saying, like uh, uh, growing through the storm and uh, being an actor of faith, I was able to just kind of connect with you on that because when my wife left me, it was around Christmas time of 2020, and it was a it was a five year relationship that just blindsided. Yeah, it's it's not easy. Like looking back on it, I was definitely in a state of depression, but I would never admit it because I always prided myself on being the kind of guy that no matter what was going on in my life. You'll never know because I will smile. I will make your day sure. despite what was going on in my life. But it was very tough around that time. And this is what I credit God and Christ for coming into my life. This was um, about five days after my breakup. And up until this point, I was mm -hmm. raised Catholic, but I was never, when I say not faithful, I didn't pray often. I never went Practice. to church. Yeah, yeah, I never I good yeah, thank you. I never practiced the faith. I would pray occasionally, knew sure. that God was real, but didn't know what that meant. So this one night, um five four or five, this yeah, I think four days after the breakup. And also to put it into perspective too, since I was two weeks away from moving to New York, I gave up my apartment. I was sleeping on my friend's living room floor because I said, I could do that for a month before I move home and be with the love of my life. Why not? So I didn't sure. really have a private place to emote. So as oh, I'm sure no. you all yeah. as as I'm sure you all okay. know, when you are heartbroken, it's nice to cry, it's nice to vent. And I was only doing that as soon as my friend would go to sleep at like 10 or 11 at night and then just cry all night, maybe get an hour or two of sleep. So by the fourth night that got old and I reached a breaking point and I said, you know, I looked at her uh, social media and as most people do, 
they she started deleting pictures of us. So, yep, that, that hurts. Yeah, because then I'm like, you know, everything was racing. How after four and a half years can we do this? And then you're not talking to that person that you've talked to every day for over four years. So you're just lost. And then suddenly she's deleting pictures and you're wondering what's happening, what's going on. Not one part of me thought she was seeing someone else or cheating on me. More, more of that to come later. But going back to this night, I was at th th that was my breaking point. I said, yeah. that's it. Screw this. I went to my friend's cabinet, grabbed a bottle. It was Grey Goose. And I'm not a big drinker, not a smoker. I have asthma. Right. So I'm blessed that alcohol. Do not tell the fire academy that. Uh, do not <laughs> mention that ever. No, definitely not. No. So I'm blessed that none of those are my vices. But yeah. this night, I just wanted an escape. I just didn't want to feel anything. All I wanted to do was go numb mm. and just be able to one night get some solid sleep. Because I was burning myself out. I was um, part of, um, I was dubbing a, a children's series at the time. I was uh, filming my first feature and prepared to move back home with no apartment too, mind you. So it was a bit much. So I grabbed the bottle of vodka and my intention was to just chug it until I just didn't feel anything. And then it just pass out and to finally have a night of rest where I didn't think about this. Mm -hmm. So put the bottle to my mouth and I'm not sure if only audio is recording, video is recording, but if I'm holding this bottle, yeah. all I had to do was tilt up like an inch, just slightly. And the alcohol would have started flowing in my system. Now what I can only credit to divine intervention when I tell you I couldn't drink that bottle, literally, I was holding the bottle, felt like somebody was grabbing my wrist, and I couldn't even move it. Yeah. I was shaking. And then I, after like a minute, I'm like thinking, what is going on? I just want to drink this alcohol. Why can't I do this? I just slammed the bottle down. I just collapse on the floor, and I'm bawling. Cause I'm like, I, there's no escape from this pain. What do I do? Yeah. That one of my lowest moments by far. So in that moment, I reflected back on my Catholic faith. I got on my knees and I prayed mm -hmm. and I said, God, what the hell is wrong with you? How can you allow this to happen to me? Everything I thought I knew was wrong. I was supposed to move back home. We were supposed to start our lives together. We loved each other. Last week, she told me she loved me. I'm like, I don't know what to do. But yeah. as I'm also praying, I say, the, I don't know much about you, but what I do know is you do everything for, for a reason. Everything you do has a purpose. So I'm giving you my life. I said, Christ, I am yours. And that was one of the defining moments of my life. Jeez, man. You know, like, uh, I, I could totally relate on a lot of levels. Um, I'm on the other side of the spectrum a little bit because I've been going to church since I was 14, uh, ushered at city light church in Astoria, Queens. And, uh, to my shocking surprise, uh, as an usher, they actually gave me an award as a usher and a member of the community. Cause I, out of a lot of people who were at that church, like, uh, I, I, I get looking back, I know that I was sort of like a critical team member and like it, a, it was really validating actually to be recognized amongst the peers like that. It was, it was really sweet. They gave me this, uh, crystal, uh, award, um, uh, in 2018, because uh, at that point, I think I was ushering for either three and a half, four years, give or take at the time. And uh, it's a type of it's a non-denominational church uh, where there's a lot of prayer that closes out uh, the sermon. And of course, you got the prayer team in the front and the ushers or they got your back just in case uh, you do go down. And wow. yeah, many times like like it would happen every week, like somebody. And when you live in New York, you're carrying you're carrying a lot of burden all the time. It's a very difficult place to live and to have faith in New York City. Uh, you need to have faith in New York City to actually get through it because it's a concrete jungle. You know, it's a very stressful environment. And uh, I guess that release when you need to talk to somebody and a prayer and a prayer warrior like on the prayer team, I would be there at that point where 
nine times out of 10, somebody that day was going to just break down, cry, fall, you name it. I was always there to catch somebody. That's Countless beautiful. Times. That's beautiful and, and very powerful too. And so, I mean, like I've always, like I've always had a heart to serve and kind of being the chairman of the board or whatever I am, like, I don't care about the titles or anything. I started a charity like uh, the Astoria Filmmakers Club because I really felt that having, having a nonprofit to really look out for the best interests of filmmakers, actors like myself, it's a resource and a tool that I didn't have immediately after uh, finishing acting school and all this stuff and trying to even get a job. There was no community. So I thought, all right, so it doesn't exist. Then I'll build one to kind of just like fast forward. It was, it, it was it, for me, like when my wife came, it was like an answered prayer because there was always something missing that, you know, I was on this journey for years by myself and it's like, you know, I want, I'm, I want to get married. I want to have a family. I, I want to be a working actor. Like I'm sure most of our listeners do, or any man listening definitely would like. And, um, I talked to, I, I had a real one-on-one -on -one with pastor Mike white shout out about like my future. And I'm only 28 or 29 years old when we really had that conversation. And, uh, like we just really prayed for my wife to show up and sure enough, she did. But man, oh fucking man, bro. Cause like, I know Jesus is real. I know everything is true. I know it's real. I know God is real. And I'm, I'm by no means the best example of being a great Christian because I'm not, not by, not by a long shot. I, brother, I don't even like to no, brother. None of us are perfect. That's why Christ went to the cross. That's it's, uh, and this is what people don't realize about not just being a Christian, but being of the faith, being a believer. Yeah. It's a daily struggle. Christ says you have to die to yourself daily. Every day. And every every day. day. It's a struggle. And you're going to get mocked. You're going to get laughed at. People are going to look at you differently. Of course. But that's, In this that's industry, it's first and foremost, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, like, like here, here's a battlefield. You know, um, being being in the industry, being in the filmmaking industry, being an actor, be a creator, you name it. Like it's a, I always found it to be a spiritual practice um, because I think it is. I think there's a light side as well as a dark side because there's a lot of lying and manipulation. But there's a lot of truth in some of these things and these circumstances that we're exploring. And it's interesting that we as actors could actually find out more about ourselves when we actually go through an imaginary circumstance and you're learning things about yourself. And personally for me, that's something I became really passionate or not addicted to, but that was something that always kept me coming back is that I learned so much about me, the person uh, as an actor playing all these different characters. And that's why I never once could not say no to a gig. Not that we should anyway, you need the experience, but I, there was always takeaway to contribute to like uh, your, your next gig or the man you become and uh i guess what i want i guess uh what i wanted to kind of just say was like um since there is a dark side to this and god is real jesus is real that means satan is real too and uh just to kind of experience the dark side of christianity or the faith in the world of the war that you know our weapons are 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 uh uh, our weapons of warfare are not of this world but they're uh against principalities and uh uh, from a completely different dimension in a different realm. And that is some spooky stuff. Cause even in like doing a play or on film, you're actually, for me, you're tapping into that spiritual realm and the, and the camera is capturing that on, on footage. Oh, absolutely. And it's weird. Cause you know, you meet a lot of people of the faith that don't believe that there's a Satan or that don't believe that there's a hell, but there is Christ, Christ literally says multiple times. I mean, Satan tempted Jesus. There yeah. is a hell and you can actually look, you know, cause there's a lot of people that don't believe because there's no evidence. Well, of course there's no hard evidence. Cause then that takes away faith completely. But yeah, you can look up stories of people dying and come back to life. A lot of majority of them that have experienced a glimpse of heaven all have the same story. There's some of them that experience the other side, the other side. I've That's, seen it. That's yeah, some scary. And, that is terrifying, dude. And it, I believe, I believe these witnesses. I do. I, oh, absolutely. Because if you want to get scientific about it, why are all these different people? Why do all that? Why, why do all of them have the same story? They don't know each be, other. No. And they're from other sides of the world, other sides of the country saying how when they died, they just saw fire and demons or they saw an indescribable blue. I actually read the story where somebody died 
went to heaven for a brief period. And it was this certain color blue that did not exist on earth because they tried to find it. They could not find it. Well, it's actually indigo and uh, we can get a little bit into that. But yeah. Please continue. Oh yeah. But no, that's pretty much, yeah. Like to like what you're saying. Absolutely. Like, and to everyone out there, there's a spiritual warfare. Like it sounds crazy when you say it out loud, but it is true. I don't know. Going back to like what you're saying, like what a, a lot of my pushback, and actually, I currently don't talk to a friend of mine who was a best friend for almost 20 years because of my now, like, when I say now my faith in Christ, I mean the fact that I'm not hiding it anymore. The fact that I will never deny Christ in front of people. And he didn't like that because it was changing the person I was. So one of his arguments was that, oh, people in the church, religious people are hypocritical. Some of them are greedy. Some of them are this, or some of them are mean, whatever. I said, listen, man, you encounter that in all walks of life. The yeah. church is not perfect. The people who persecuted Christ were the religious leaders of the time, which goes to show you. So, yeah, it's everywhere, sadly. There's a really good actor. Um, his name is uh, Greg uh, Kinnear or Greg Kinner. Uh, I think he was in uh, uh, Something's Gotta Give, uh, things like that. You ever see that movie? I love Something's Gotta Give. I just watched that recently, actually. He did a he did a movie. I'm actually looking it up right now. Um, he plays the father of his son, who dies and goes to heaven, uh, and then uh, and then he comes back. And I'm looking. Oh, is this um? That is that a Heaven Is Real? I've seen that movie. The, I think that's the name like, of it. I'm sh if yes, I so. can get the if, if this if is I can the get same... the name of it or Heaven Is Real, but the year because. He's yeah, in stuck I, in love, modern family, uh, the Kennedys, the nice. Like, this is a real working actor, and this guy, this guy's awesome. Yeah, because I've, I've seen this, I've seen this film. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's that his film. wife is a woman from uh uh Yellowstone, um uh in this movie, and it's about the kid who dies and he goes to heaven and he literally talks about coming back, and it's based on a true story. So to like literally go back to what you're saying, oh, it's right, he played Dick from Neil in Invincible. That's right, forgot about that. If it's heaven is real, I'm just looking. I'm looking for an IMDb, but I can't see. Uh, I hope he got credited for it. I'll just look up heaven is real. But I know that. But to, to your point, like, like this is something that you got to take into an account and consideration because we got modern day witnesses uh, keeping the Bible alive and pretty much like all things included, such as like what happens the day before you're born and the day after you're born, and that we're on the timeline, like. You, you got to take this into account literally on how that like how it influences the choices that you're going to make. And literally, um, I think it's a book of Proverbs that talks about uh, that we can make our plans, but it's actually God who will orchestrate and direct our steps. Oh, trust me. Absolutely. And I credit to. So on on that note, it was July of 2023. Got so it. a little over a year ago that. Probably, again, every time I thought the storm was over, it wasn't. Every time I thought I had the answer, I didn't. So, and Jonathan Rumi talks about this, the actor who plays Jesus in The Chosen in his documentary, which is... We're going to circle back. Yeah, we're, I, lo I love that show. Guys from Queens, please. Oh, okay, that, is a sh that is a show that I'm like, I need to be on this show. Even though Likewise. I might play one of the, even though I might play one of the Romans, cause clearly like yeah. I've, I've red facial hair, blue eyes. So I'm like, I want to be an integral part of that show. I love that show. But anyway... Yeah, I reached this point in July 2023 where, again, at a new low, everything that could go wrong went wrong. We're at the peak of the strikes, mind you. And yep. this was along my journey. <sighs> Already so much has happened. We can circle back to that. But I just, and I got baptized too two months before this for the second time, reconfirming my faith. Yep. So I just got on my knees. There was a statue of Christ in Burbank at St. Finbar's church that I would just go to, pray, talk to God. And I said, okay, Christ, I have tried this my way. I keep thinking I'm doing the right thing, but it keeps getting worse. I don't know what to do. So I said, that's it. I am yours. Not my will. Your will be done. My life, everything I have is yours. Use me as a vessel for your blessing. Mm -hmm. And... Literally, now I can I can safely say this. The turnaround started, I kid you not, a couple weeks after that. 
which led to a domino effect of blessings that led me to here today. That was last year during the strike? Last year during the strikes, yep. And I'll tell you, so what this domino effect, what this was, and this is not me bragging. Yeah, yeah. This is just me telling you what happened in my life, which I believe is one of my purposes on this earth, after I went through this battle, went through this journey, yeah. and fully gave my life to Christ, truly, but surrendered everything, complete surrender. It's August of 23, so a little over a year ago, and first of all, every day when I wake up, I pray. So now I'm, of course, going to be praying for you too, my friend. But I always thank God that thank something you. good's going to happen to me today. And then I look out for the blessings because I'm like, something good's going to happen to me. What is it? Yeah. And tell me that this is not divine intervention. I'm at the Anaheim Fit Expo mm -hmm. in Orange County, California. And of course, again, just a quick time frame here. Peak strikes, zero work in the film industry. All of my catering jobs and side gigs in LA were slowly ceasing because nobody was doing anything because LA thrives on film. So f finance wise, I barely had two pennies to rub together. Sure. So, and also at this point, I realized everything happens for a reason. Of course, the strikes made me realize Los Angeles, as much as I thought I loved it, even though a lot of my friends were out there, wasn't my city. I'm not a Californian. I was a New Yorker in denial. Also all my family's here. So, and I realized after, eight years of being out there. I did my time. I'm perfectly content leaving. So at this Fit Expo, something inside me was like, how am I not doing this? I love fitness. I love sure. working out. So I literally go to every single booth and I ask them, <laughs> how do you do this? Just like that. And they're like, oh, well, you'd only work twice a year at trade shows. We're not hiring. No, we're not looking for people. I'm like, all right, striking out every corner. Yeah. So right. about like the 25th booth, because I started literally on one end. I'll never forget, I come to the All Max booth. Same thing. I asked the guy, how do you do this? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I love your brand. I've been using your stuff for years. My dad's been using you guys for years. How do you work these trade shows? And the guy looks at me and he's like, where do you live? I'm like I live right here in California, but at the end of August, I'm moving back to New York. His eyes lit up. He's like, oh my gosh, our Northeast Territory manager just quit last week. And Let's go, for, bro. And we're looking for somebody. Are you interested? And at the time, my mind, I didn't realize what an opportunity that was. So I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? Gives me his card. He's like, send me an email. I'll put you in touch with the bosses. I forgot to email him for a week because I was also packing my stuff and moving. So I sent him an email. He puts me in touch with the bosses as I'm driving from Los Angeles to New York for the fourth time, because yes, during my peak heartbreak, I did drive to New York. There's more on that later, but <laughs> as I'm driving, I'm scheduling a zoom interview with the owners of all Max supplements, not realizing what a big deal this is the day after I get back again. We're still on strikes, so I don't know what I'm going to do. My parents, they're union workers, so they're like, what are you doing? You have nothing, blah, 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 whatever. But yeah. I operate faith-based, not fear-based, so I knew something was going to happen. So yeah, of course. I had this interview, went along great. Zoom interview number two, killed it. Number three, they were like, we're narrowing down. Is this something you really want to do? I'm like, yeah. And then end of September, so a year this month, they called me and they said, we want to offer you the job. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. That's I don't go, curse bro. often. Bro, dude, and, I don't, you're in New York now. It's common, yeah. but still, I get it. This is a, this is a fuck yeah moment. It, oh, it, I didn't realize it at the time because my first thought was, oh my gosh. Okay. I'm as an, you know, as an actor, somebody in, in the industry, you know, it's tough to know where the next check's coming from. I was like, whoa. I know how much money we're getting each month and it's a damn good salary and I get free supplements. So I was like, this is amazing. But yeah, my yeah. first thought always goes back to my passion. I'm like, what does this mean for film? I'm like how much sacrifice am I going to have to do? Cause this is a sure. great opportunity and I want to give it my all. So I tell people pray bold prayers and get specific with your prayers because I prayed a prayer a while ago said, God, why can't there be a job? that's flexible, that I can manage my own time, that's in an industry I love that pays well. Impossible yeah. ask, but that's exactly 
what this career is at Allmax. Being the Northeast Territory Manager, I own my own business through Allmax. So how I run it, it's up to me. I don't have set hours. My bosses are the best people in the world, so they're not breathing down my neck. As long as I have my computer, I can work from anywhere, except for if I'm visiting my accounts. So I thank God every day because he gave me a perfect career. I don't like using the word job because that means people don't like it usually. This career works hand in hand with my passion for film and acting. So that blessing number one, they say everything comes in threes. Blessing number two, as I was, you know, starting to figure out All Max, this was October of last year now. I get a phone call from a director friend of mine in Michigan. I filmed a faith-based series with him a couple years ago, and I was on his good graces. So he calls me, and he says, hey, Joe, what's your schedule looking like November or December? Okay. I said, why? And his name's Aaron Greer, by the way. Shout out to Aaron Greer, one of the best, most humble, kind people I know. Also very oh, faithful, too. Um, he says, because I have a feature film, and I loved working with you. I have you in mind for the lead. Would you want to do a chemistry read with the actress? Nice. So I was like, uh, yeah, let me check my schedule. No, I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> when? <laughs> so right, scheduled, right. we scheduled a table read. Went off great. He Good. called me like a few, like an hour later because he talked with the actress. Like, what'd you think? Um, I met her briefly before. So he called me. He's like, so how would you like to part as the lead role? in the movie, A Soldier for Christmas. To which I All said, right. uh, I don't know. No, I was like, yes, when are we filming? So we filmed that December of last year in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Once again, thanks to my amazing career at All Max and because I have an amazing laptop, I didn't miss a beat work-wise, realizing truly this amazing opportunity that God put in front of me with right. this career. The film is set to come out holiday of this year, and I'll have more details on where later. But it was my first time starring in a feature film as the lead. And this is the first one that's coming out. I have other films I did, but this is the first one that's coming out, which I pray is going to start a domino effect of more to come. So not only that, again, I sure. went through three and a half years of hell. It felt like hell to get to here. January of 2024. So now we're yep. in this year. Yep. I get a quasi sketchy email from the New York City Fire Department because I took the test seven years ago. Because kind of like you, I have a heart to give. I was like, if there's anything I could see myself doing outside the film industry, it's being a fireman. Yep. So I got an email just simply saying, are you still interested in becoming a New York City firefighter? Click here. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I Why click. Not? I click uh -huh. yes, and part of me was expecting, okay, now give us your social security, your bank information, your credit card number. So I'm like, No, oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was expecting that, but then it just said, thank you for your response. I'm like, all right. Don't okay. know what's happening with that. Then a month later, I got this packet in the mail telling me about the CPAT training, which is a candid phys physical ability test, which is the first thing you have to pass. So we are now. Yeah, no running. Oh, well, no, no, you have to. Like, I've been making yeah, running, running my best. They, they, they yeah. wouldn't allow you to actually, you had to walk. Oh, uh, no, no. So for the CPAT, no, no. Yeah, no running for that. Right. I have I have been running in preparation for firefighter training, but, you know, good on oh, you. No. Absolutely no running. Fast walking. The yes, test yes. was brutal. Yeah. I switched up my style of training because my father, he's an old school bodybuilder trained me the ways of the 70s and 80s barbells oh, dumbbells no. proper form so i was i love training that way but now training to be a firefighter which like i said i'm so far set to go in the academy in january since about july it hurts me to say this but i've abandoned weights for the most part still do it occasionally That's switch right. up my switch up my training but anyway point being Mm -hmm. wave after wave after wave of blessings coming my way. My New York agents, I did um, 
social media uh, commercial in July where I play the gym douche. I wasn't, I was wearing no shirt the whole time. It's the first time that ever happened. I was that guy too. in a different thing a few years ago, I get it. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> I got to bring out my gym douche character and there's more coming out with that. Um, I recently did a modeling gig right here in the Hudson Valley. And just today job, man. I have like five auditions I have to do on top of my work for all Mac. So it's a busy, but it's a great busy. Oh, and also last month in July. No, sorry. That's two months ago already. Damn. Yeah, um, yeah, I wrapped up a gig with Samsung where I was the main host slash presenter for the duration of their event. Because when giving me a microphone, I can talk all day with it. And I thrive in that again, though. Yes, I am blessed and highly favored at this point. We always are. There's yeah. so much good happening. But to the people out there that are still in your storm and struggling, I don't want you to think that this is a brag. Like, look at all this. Look at everything good. No, I can only say that everything's going good because one, my storm started November 30th, 2020. And there was, again, in that time, I've been in two car accidents in my brand new car. I lost two of my closest aunts. I come from a big Italian family, so we're all close. I, I had to watch... My Nona slowly suffer and ultimately die in 2022. I had to accept the fact and find out that my ex not only lied to my face and cheated on me, but got engaged to the guy she was cheating on me with a little over a year after we broke up. On top of dealing with these strikes, barely having two pennies to rub together, all in like a three and a half year bout. So it was tough there was moments there was times where i literally questioned everything where i said maybe my parents are right i should just give up get a job i hate just to make ends meet there was times where i wanted to call it quits there was times where i cursed god and i'm like there's no way yeah like and i know my struggles pale in comparison to some others but again the entire time even when it got tough i just kept circling back to faith you read the scriptures more you see Joseph, for example, in the Bible, how long was his trial and suffering? Like 13 years? That poor guy. Well, I think it was I think it was like it was closer to 15 almost. Yeah. If you kind of if you kind of kind of just like really think about it, because leading up to like him like fleeing, then he meets Rachel and uh I don't I forgot the name of the dad, but he was a jerk. I don't care about him. Oh yeah. But you know, kind of <laughs> just getting swindled. It's just like, yeah, just you worked for me for seven years. I'll give you my daughter. No problem. It's like flex. And it's just, I, I kind of like, it always bothered me how it's just like, yeah, I'll just give you my daughter. Not a big deal. All right. And back then in those sudden, days, you know, <laughs> it's just like, it, it kind of just sums up like uh, how women were treated in a lot of ways where it's just like, uh, like property. It's just like, yes, I belong to my father. He's as headship over me. And that's why like, here comes the bride. You give them away headship. I, I kind of understand like, you know, the symbolism behind everything, but just the act of doing it, you know, it's just, it's kind of just zinger. Like, and I'm part Jewish. So it's just like, even for me, it's like, bro, no, there's no, I can't imagine my dad. I can't imagine my dad ever doing something like that uh, with my sister. And on top of like seven years, he worked his butt off and, you know, he got betrayed and there's like, all right, do over. Then I'll just give you my second daughter. And then this guy walks away with two wives and then later gets two mistresses with four kids. And, you know, it's, it, it just created a whole mess between, I think it was Esau and Jacob, all of these, all of these things that are now just present day, uh, Middle East of tribal warfare, you know? Oh, absolutely. But it's actually funny. You're talking about a different Joseph. The one I was talking about was the one who his oh, brothers... Oh, got sold into Egypt. Yeah, those oh, brothers... You, I'm sorry. You should have no, 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 no. I thought you said, no, no, I thought you said Jacob. No, oh, no, no, it's fine. So, yes, he no, was it's fun, slavery. Because it was funny. It's I'm part, like, wait it's part of the family, though. No, no, no. Because, yeah. yeah, that's actually Jacob's son. Or, yeah. uh, so never mind. Well, that's, oh, why I'm, that's why I'm like, hey, you know, you're not far off. You were in the same lineage, at least. But No, I, all right. I but totally I, did not hear you oh, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You're fine. But, you know, if you're going through a storm right now, if you're going through a struggle or if something just happened and you feel like your world collapsed, not just look at my short story look at the look at our heroes of faith now joseph yes joseph <laughs> um look giuseppe. at what happened to him giuseppe yes that's what giuseppe. my nona called me by the way so <laughs> yes I, you may call me giuseppe shout out to you nona i love you um joseph was promised he'd be a ruler of egypt god gave him the vision and god will always give you a vision 
He'll show you what you're capable of, but he's not going to show you the journey because if God shows you the journey, you're going to want to stop about a quarter of the way through. Like I swear to you, if somebody told me, somebody told me two years into my four and a half year relationship that she was eventually going to leave me, I would have called it quits. I would have been like, done. I'm leaving LA, moving back to New York, but I wouldn't have been the man I am today. I wouldn't have had this faith. I wouldn't have had, I definitely wouldn't have had this career at all, Max. I probably would have given up acting a while ago. And now going back to the biblical part of it, Joseph, when his brothers found out he was blessed and highly favored, if for those of you that don't know, you know what they did? They not only beat him, but they (laughs) threw him into a pit. We're going to kill him, but instead made a profit and sold him into slavery. Yeah. And it goes to show how you go through the struggles determines how you're going to end up. Because Joseph, you never read about him complaining. You never read about him crying or like cursing God. He then goes to work for Potiphar, becomes Potiphar's best worker. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. Yep. Joseph, a man of integrity and honor, runs away instead of even staying to be slightly tempted. And even yep. though he does the right thing, he goes Paid to prison because yep. Potiphar's wife lied. So again, think of what's Women. going on in your life. I know, right? I know. Think of, like whatever's going on in your life, like what's going on, what was going on in mine, for example, like, like right after my ex broke up with me, I think it's going to get better after I give my life to Christ. My first aunt dies a month later. I'm like, okay, it can't get worse than this. Then my second aunt dies. Then I think, oh my gosh, it's not going to get worse than this. Then that's when my Nona mentally suddenly took a big downhill turn. And then I think, all right, it's fine. It's going to get better now. Then I got into my first car accident, had no car for three months. So it just keeps getting worse like Joseph. But again, I didn't know what exactly the vision God put in me, but I knew I was meant for something more. I knew that I was meant to achieve greatness, whether it is in film, whether it is ultimately becoming a New York city firefighter, but I know Greatness and destiny was in my future. So even during the hardest times, I never stopped praying, whether it be watching sermons. Billy Graham is my favorite, by the way, going to that statue at St. Finbar's and just praying, going to church and just bawling, reading the scriptures more. So again, going back to Joseph, he's in prison now, and he just tells his cellmate when he gets out to remember him, he doesn't, he just gets out and lives his best life until the king has a dream that the, no one no one can interpret that butler the guy remembers wait a minute my cellmate can interpret dreams goes back to joseph he interprets the king's dream the king makes him ruler of egypt fulfilling god's promise for him but think about it would joseph have gotten there if he cursed god complained did give in a temptation like with potiphar's wife and took the easy way out highly doubt it and there's a saying that david said that I love because I'm actually currently seeing this in my life where God blesses you in the presence of your enemies and makes your enemies, your footstools. For those of you that don't know what that means, it means our natural human instinct is to take revenge. The first thing, first thing I thought of, this is going to sound so stupid, but the first thing I thought of when my ex broke up with me is, Oh, I can't wait until I make it and shove it in her face and let her know what she missed out on or I actually thought of just going to her house, having that psychotic ex-boyfriend moment and just saying, what the hell's wrong with you? How could you be doing this to me? Every instinct that was, that's what I wanted to do more than anything. But yeah, I get it. I, again, just took the harder route at the time, took the faithful route, which at the time, yes, sucked. But again, God makes your enemies, your footstools. In Joseph's case, Joseph now had his brothers coming to him because there's going to be a big famine and his brothers yep. needed food from him. And his brothers now see that their brother that they sold into slavery somehow worked his way up to being ruler of Egypt. And again, I'm not naming names, but in my case, coincidentally, my ex postponed her wedding a whole year after already delaying it two years. You know, do I wish it on her? No, of course not. But at the same time, yeah. am I shocked? No, because no. I believe I believe how you deal with your troubles determines the kind of person you are. And sadly, people show or their true colors. Not do, 
or even like like what you said, just by not growing through it, you know, like if you're a little bit more avoidant or if you want to try to manipulate the situation and be a little bit more on the outskirts, just so you don't have to uh, just sort of, well, deal with anything being kind of passive, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, I, man. I, I think that's a shame. Kind of just looking back on it, just kind of like, you know, to relate what you were talking about. Um, when my ex left me, uh like, uh, I was, I, I was devastated and, you know, it took me, uh, a couple of years to really just sort of like, feel like I was getting back to normal and feeling my strength again. And that must've been from, tough too, because she was an answered prayer and you yes. think, and you think so this, it's, it's, yeah, like this, this answered prayer, like what's going on. So like this, I'm really angry with God a lot of days because like, it's like, I, I thought you and I had an understanding and I did, and I did all this work and I didn't ask and I didn't do all this stuff in, if, be, because I wanted something in exchange. No, I did my part and you had my back and now I'm doing this. And what, what what's the problem here? Like, what, what, so like I'm, I battle that on a regular basis. I'm sort of on that back end of the conversation where it's like, not the faith being compromised or just me compromising or anything like that. But like, I'm putting the facts on the table being like, hold on a second, you and me now, let, let, why don't you and I just have a real conversation. And I have the, I have, I've had that constantly all year because here's why when my ex left, I wanted to just, you know, I'm calling it quits. So I was suicidal. Uh, I couldn't, I, I could not comprehend anything. Um, for over a year, everything, every, like you, she was a saint at one point, And then all of a sudden it was like a Jacqueline, Mr. Hyde thing. It did not make any sense. It was like, like, I still can't even comprehend it. So I had to write down everything that was circling in my head. And I kind of came to terms on sort of with the facts on, okay, this is true. This is what was said. What is your interpretation of it? So I see a pattern that there's a lot of personal growth and uh, faith that she has to first go through to become a real absolute woman, you know, like just a woman of valor, that type of stuff. Like day one, she grew up Catholic. I brought her to church and she was making phenomenal progress, bro. Like I was telling you before about being an usher, there were times she would go get prayer and I was there to catch her. Uh, I, I, I couldn't have been more proud. I was so, I was so happy. And I know that, you know, in her personal story, she's got a lot of work to do as we all do. So if her path is going this way and my path is going the other way, then so be it. Like you got to trust God no matter what. But I was so down where I had this vision where it's just like, wouldn't it be nice if we all had a community where we could find work and even create work together and which eventually became the AFC and literally within the year of the pandemic, getting the 501c3, getting fired wrongfully from my essential job, mm -hmm. um, suing that job for wrongful termination, even like all this stuff where it's just like, I know I'm not wrong. And I fought through it and I end up winning that case. That's another story. But she left with like and didn't even believe like reality was real. And I get it. The pandemic was such a messed up time where nobody was thinking clearly. So I really thought that had a lot to do with it because like I'll never like talk ill about her because she is a great woman. No doubt. Just how you handle situations or not handle situations. That is the issue. So if she's got to learn the hard way, then it's going to take her some time. I did get her a Bible, though, on that last Christmas before she uh, before she dipped. So I think it's only a matter of time. It's like it's there when you need it. And that that's sort of like a part, not even a parting gift. I didn't even, like I didn't know she was going to just like leave at Christmas time. The, but anyway, mm. what I was saying was like I came to a point where I was so down and depressed where I just didn't want for anything anymore answer prayer like all this shit and it's like well, I, I and i was even like i had to go through like a homeless season like like seven years prior uh, before getting to this point i'm like what do you think you're doing uh, and i got really mad at god because of this so like i was ready to check out call it quits i started dissolving everything i threw out all of every, every educational thing that I got from acting school threw it out. Every single item of clothing that either was like a shared item from the marriage gone, even like my, like uh family heirlooms that I inherited thrown out nothing. I was I, like, I was completely, I was dead. I was a dead man walking. Mm -hmm. I was dead. Uh, I can sadly relate. <laughs> it's the only thing that stopped me though, was that until the AFC was officially terminated, I didn't want to put it on my board of directors that they're just going to have to deal with the president committing suicide. 
And my conscience just kind of said, okay, if that's your choice, but are you really going to leave this on your teammates? You gonna Is that how you want them to remember the last thing? Like little things like that would come through my head. I'm like, all right, fine. But I was committed to uh, committing suicide, not going to lie. But within a year going on, I think it was the end of 21 going into 2022. Like, you know, I was just going through the day, just biding my time. I gained 70 pounds. I drank myself to sleep. I ate fast food every single day. Uh, and my blood levels, all this medical stuff was like going, uh, like there were some legit concerns from medical professionals at that point. They didn't know so much that I was suicidal, but I was trying to seek a little bit of, uh, help just to kind of keep me alive until this thing got, you know, dissolved New York state, uh, about a year after that it canceled the dissolvement in, I think, 2022. So I've asked why. They said, because you didn't file any of your taxes. I'm like, we didn't do any business the first year or anything like that. There are no taxes. I didn't do anything yet. Exactly. But you didn't actually file it. So I'm pissed at this point. Or no, I couldn't even emote anger. I was so, I was already suffering. It was you like know, you were fear. broken and you were just... It didn't even phase me like yeah. and I like it, it really hurt because I lost my best friend, Nino Navalino, at right at the end of like the divorce. Uh, I had nobody console with me. So that kind of led me to even seek medical therapy at all. Like I had nothing, no support, not one fucking thing. And of course, my family, uh, they're going through their stuff constantly. But it just really bothers me on how much chaos in a storm and a tornado is here all the time in the presence in the midst of us. And it's just like, this is not family. This is not life. And it's definitely not the life I want to live. So what do we got to do to break the cycle here? And I, I got to a point where that was it. I was done. Like, th th this is ridiculous. Embark on your unique financial journey with Mid-Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union. Your aspirations, your milestones. We're committed to guiding you every step of the way. Whether you're saving for a dream home, planning for retirement, or seeking to consolidate debt, trust MHV to provide personalized solutions tailored to your needs. Our comprehensive range of products and services, coupled with expert financial advice, empowers you to make informed decisions and achieve your goals. Visit us online at mhvfcu.com to discover the tools and resources available to help you navigate your financial landscape with confidence and clarity. Your journey starts here. So what ended up happening was um, in 2022, it was like, I think the maybe the back end of winter and spring, uh, I ended up getting wrongfully terminated from another job. And that's entirely a different story. I'm like, I, now I'm just like pissed where it's just like, I'm doing nothing wrong. Uh, several months later, I had a, a case settlement from the lawsuit from the pandemic. So there was a little bit of breath of air uh, from that. But before that, I got a call or an email about this uh a uh, project called monkey bars. Um, and that was a very interesting sign because before I even started the Astoria filmmakers club, I was working with that same director on a different project in Staten Island called the degenerates. And it was at that time in March of 2019, I just asked, do you guys know of any like groups or anything where we could actually like find work and would it be nice if there was one? And they said, that'd be a great idea. So that's where it all started in March of 2019 on me just like, coming up with the idea of like, what would it look like? Long story short, in 2019, I just started doing mixers and meetups. But by Christmas time of 2019, over 100 people had come to dinner and drink a beer and just be like, yeah, we're interested, man. So fast forward to like that guy, shout out Chris, director of Monkey Bars and the Degenerates. Uh, he wanted to, you know, just know, hey, what's going on with AFC? AFC? It was like right around that time in summertime, give or take, where the pandemic was kind of just, you know, stopping where people could actually go out and go to restaurants again. I'm like, all right. And I'm 70 pounds heavier than the last time anybody saw me. I'm really embarrassed enough, but I just, I didn't care anymore. I was so numb, dude. Like I can't even describe how numb I was. We started having mixers and meetings again. And I think like 50 or 60 people showed up for that one mixer and meeting, took a picture, put on social media. It's like, we're still here, baby. And I was so curious and pissed off where it's like, I have nothing to lose. If I were to just, if I were really to do this and I gave it my 100%, even operating the 1% version of myself, if I were to give it 100% of what I am capable of, 
is that maybe that's the legacy I want to leave behind. So it was around that time where I created the Triborough Film Festival just to kind of be like, okay, AFC, the mixes and meetings are still happening. Does anybody have a movie that they made or want to show during the last year, year and a half, whatever it was, just to kind of start bringing people back together? And it was around the following January of 2023 where we premiered the Triborough Film Festival. And from all the settlement money that I won, had to pay a, a ton of fucking taxes. But with whatever was left over, just catch up, eliminate all my debt or whatever, and start the festival and just see what I could do. So... I don't want to say we hit a home run right off the bat, but I mean, it was for an inexperience. Like you could, you could tell like none of us had experience or anything like that, but we got through it and we got through it pretty well because we had over 50 submissions, uh, uh, by, by the, by, it was a two day festival where we showed all that work it was like 19 hours of footage and it was a great turnout. And then within the month we created what was called the Aster award ceremony, kind of like the Oscars in LA, but the AFC has the Aster award after Astoria Queens. And we, that was it. And then, all right, did it. That's where things started to get really hectic because, all right, we got through it. We left a positive impression more people are still showing up and i guess it was in the middle of 2023 where i'm just like now what do i do um because i'm still committed to suicide at this point i'm going to therapy and it's just like i'm just kind of going through the going through motions man and one thing that kind of just popped up is saying okay so you know who can make a movie you know them now they all know you the Astoria Filmmakers Club was built to be a space where you could actually create original content, yes? So what would it look like if you started with just one project, you bring everybody together, and you start developing that project? Do you have one that's ready? And I had like three or four, and I tried all three or four, but only one actually really caught any traction. So it was July of last year um, where we started pre-production for this uh, movie slash book slash TV show series. We don't know. I have no idea what it really is yet, but now it's it, like it's it, it's got potential. So it's a story called Fireland because I didn't get to actually uh, tell you, but my dad is a 9-11 first responder for the FDMY. And I oh almost became a, yeah, I became I almost became a firefighter. And there's a whole story on how it just did not work out for me. But man, like uh, uh, I became really bitter. And sometimes I really am like upset that I'm just not a regular, a regular guy, son of a firefighter who became a firefighter. And that that's my life, you know? And uh, one thing that always really bothered me that I always thought maybe my life would be different and my wife wouldn't have left if I had, of course, a career as a firefighter, all of these things circle through my head. But what I did do is create a pilot for episode one, which circled around for the past year that really got the attention um, of a lot of key people that could probably get this thing off the ground. And we were invited, the author of the book that I based the show on, and myself, we went on the Getting Salty podcast uh, this past uh, February, March. So if you're going into the FDMY, start getting yourself familiar with the Getting Salty experience because it's the number one firefighter podcast on earth. And they got like 80,000 people in their uh, Facebook group. Um, a lot of them know about Fireland and we're currently in pre-production of shooting a, a sizzle reel about that. And it kind of just like brings me to, to now where it's like, you know, I had, I had my plan, I had my goals, but it's like God directs my steps. And it's like, I'm not leaving anything unfinished, incomplete or unintended to all of that stuff. And now I'm here getting ready for season three of the Triborough Film Festival. And for all these like blessings, when cause, like, cause in 2020, of course, shit hit the fan and like, I'm, I'm, I'm going through it. But to what you were saying before about how blessings were kind of following you is that in 2023, all of 2023, and I hated it. I didn't want to be blessed. I didn't want to be recognized. I like, you're fucking my, you're fucking with my plan, bro. Like, I don't want to be here anymore. You don't get it. Like, this is bullshit. Stop giving me anything. Don't look at me. I'm just doing my thing. I'm trying to do like, I'm not like, I'm not even doing a thing. I'm just doing whatever. And it kind of got me upset, but I started getting asked to speak on panels. And I'm going to a nonprofit panel where I'm speaking before 
like a couple of hundred people in West in I think, no, in downtown Manhattan at a Jewish center at the time, and then came back uh, in Westchester for a thing called OpCon, which is like a network similar to the AFC, but it's exclusive resources just for the nonprofit community. Being a member of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce, being a member of the Queens Chamber of Commerce, being asked to actually be a part of this committee. Do you got an idea for this? And now I'm like a, a true collaborator. And just to like, you know, just to kind of like fuck with my plans, I'm get I, I got an award from the New York State Assembly for uh, the Astoria Filmmakers Club, the Triborough Film Festival, and just being Phil Capadora from New York State Assembly this past February on my birthday. And I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of just like, you know, it's just like, yep. And I feel like that now where I'm just kind of like, I'm on the back end where it's just like, yep. And now, recently, I get asked to be a lead in a movie. And, I'm, and so it's just like, great. Now I got it. Now I have to stay alive. Now I don't have a choice then other than to just go through this thing we call life, this epic journey of just feeling it all out. My bitterness on being the back end is like, yo, um, as much as I want to be a husband and a father one day, be a homeowner and just be like, not even an average guy or anything like that. I, I like, there's a part of me that yearns to have that back. The other side is, is that it's like a 50, 50 split where it's just like, I don't even want anything anymore. I don't know. It's not even a matter of, I don't know what I want anymore. I know that I want nothing anymore. I don't even want to risk anymore of getting anything. And I'm just tired of getting credit on, on just like the nice things I'm, I, I am. There's a part of me that just hates it a little bit because I don't want to be recognized. I didn't do any of this to be recognized. I didn't do this for glory. I didn't even try to do this so much to even uh, advance my career that much. I just really wanted an, a, a space to where we could create something original with the hope that I would have a steady paycheck and maybe with the hope of getting on a TV show or something. Au contraire. So... I, I got the number one nonprofit probably in the state of New York or God knows where on where filmmakers and actors could actually assemble together, create something new and springboard to that next level of union, Oscar, you name it. But a central hub on day one after school, this is where you got to be. That's what I've built. And I, I'm just like one. I'm just one bitter dude. Like I just like I'm really pissed off and frustrated. And of course, I try to go to church. I got baptized again. All of these things to try to just keep myself alive. I even like you know even with this back injury. Like I even took up jujitsu just to get punched and mixed martial arts just so I could feel anything and try to just get my anything out. And it's just like. Uh, I am just one fucked up actor. You no, know, like you know. All, and I'd rather talk about your first feature film, but I just had to follow up what you said. First of all, gosh, do you realize how powerful that is by you openly talking about all that? That is powerful. And to me, yeah. you know, there's a saying that God forces a door shut in our lives because we don't have the strength to. As hard as your divorce was, like as hard as my breakup was, at the time, I would have never thought my ex would do what she did. You would never have thought your wife did what she did. Nope. It happened. And it happened for a reason. And that's where we have to have faith to understand, okay, God, it's not my will. It's your will. And what sounds like to me, you're such an integral and important part of everything you do that not only you can just say that, but you're getting the recognition for it. And your story kind of reminds me of um, the story of Jonah. In the Bible. You know the story of Jonah? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. It's like God's telling, for those of you that don't, Jonah's the one who spent three days in the belly of the whale because God told him to go to Nineveh to preach. He didn't want to, went the other way. God caused a big storm because he kept running away from God's blessing. So eventually when Jonah said, it's me, they threw him overboard, spent three days in the whale, spat him up. Then Jonah said, God, I'm going to go and do it. Even though it might not be what do you want or what you ideal? You're helping a lot of people's dreams come true. And this is my first time meeting you, but I can already tell you, there's probably hundreds of people out there thanking God for you every day. And you have such a big purpose, like a big why, and you still have work to do. Now I'm in the same boat as you were like, I do eventually want to find 
love again. I want to be married. I would like to have kids someday. Questioning, I'm like, okay, when? I'm ready for it now. But, and it sucks because, you know, dating in 2024 is not easy, as I'm sure everybody out there knows. Yeah, so. You know, it's, well, I mean, I, dating altogether is just, it, it's kind of stupid. And I thought about it recently. Um, it's just like, isn't a date or like the beginning on before a couple becomes a couple, don't you have to get together like with parents involved and you guys all have a meal together and you just kind of spend intimacy time together instead of just working your ass off, hoping you'll meet somebody, you meet somebody, you buy them food and they fuck off. So, all right. Yeah. So, I mean, old school, it was definitely that way. And then now we have like people just get ghosted. I've been ghosted twice. Oh, sure. No, I get it. I'm, I've been there. And, yeah, it's and I, I, I don't Something understand. Always comes up. I don't understand because ladies, if you're ghosting a guy, you're saying no regardless. So how yeah. you say no just determines whether you're an asshole or not. So just say yeah. no. <laughs> Preach it, brother. No, thank you. It's just like, even I get it. No, it's just like, you know, you tell us to be a man, all that. But tell the truth. You know, oh. like, uh, like we're, we're, we, when, when the, the second we get, I don't want to say turned on, but the second that light goes on where it's just like, you got an assignment, you got a goal, you got a mission. This is, this is the plan. We execute that plan and to help, like, if it's literally just to get to a date on time, we execute that plan. There's nothing getting in the way of that. Yeah. But you know, cause my, my mom loves to give me a hard time. My mom's got what I call Nona fever. She wants so badly to be a Nona and it doesn't help that my cousins, my age are married and are having kids. And we were at the baby shower a couple weeks ago and I saw the way she was holding that baby. I'm like, Oh gosh. And, and she's she, like, yeah. And she's baby thinking, fever. she's thinking, you're not getting out there enough. You're not doing this enough. Get on hinge, get on this. And I'm like, mother, I have been ghosted twice. I have tried the apps. I just don't like him. I don't like talking to people on an app. It's just not me. I'm not a big bar guy. I'll go out occasionally, but like, I'm just not a big bar guy. And the fact that like, I've had a couple people try to set me up a couple times, not only did it not work out, but again, I got ghosted twice. I've come to this point where like I was talking about earlier, acceptance, where I've realized all the blessings I have going on in my life, almost like you do all the a blessings and good things you got going on in your life. I prayed yeah. about it. And I said, okay, I'm working all max, which of course takes up time. I'm still auditioning and still filming, which again, blessed to say I have another film coming up in October and I'm trading for FDNY, which yep. takes a lot of time yep. and it's very exhausting too. And I also trying to fit in rest along that. I said, I think I've just accepted that at this season of my life, as much as I don't want to, as much as I would love to have a girlfriend to have that person there that loves and cares for you, that'll be like, okay, what do you need? You're training for FDNY. Let me do this for you. Then, you know, no distractions. Course, yeah, I'm like, you know what? God wants me to be single right now. Wants me to put all of my focus into what's going good because at this point in my life, I cannot afford to slip up. I cannot afford to deviate. And if he feels that a woman's going to be distracting, then I said, literally, I reached this point like two nights ago. So it's funny. We're talking about this I said, okay, God, I will be single until God, up. you bring that right person along. And like, does that mean I'm closed off to a relationship? No, that right person shows up later today or tomorrow. I will welcome her to my life and I'll be so happy. But yeah, I'm finally not stressing over it or i'm not letting the ghosting get to me or the fact like yeah i'm just i'm just not letting it get to me is all just focused on the blessings that god is doing in my life and knowing and praying just like how i got out of my storm that when that right time comes i'll be like okay god i understand why i had to be single all this time because it doesn't once it happens you realize why it took so long well, don't forget, like uh, in the story with Joseph, that the storehouses had to be built first before the famine came, you know? True. Exactly. So even like as a man, like they're still like, I don't want to say cliche because it's as true today as it always ever will be. My dog is here. But uh -huh. like when it comes to like, you know, having a spouse and the responsibility of being sort of like the head of the family, becoming a firefighter first is kind of a big deal before any of that really even comes in. Like my dad was a firefighter before they got married, you know? Things like that. It's, imp it's important. It's something too. I was telling my mother, okay, mom, let's say I get a girlfriend now. It's September. 
I'm going to the academy in January. I said, Mom, do you realize that for you don't 18, want to break up. well, not even not only that, for 18 weeks, which is going to kill me. Like I have to tell my agents, don't send me things that are filming for these four and a half months because I can't do it. But for those 18 weeks, whoever I'm dating, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be 100% selfish. My life is going to be going to and from Randall's Island on yeah. Saturday. It's just going to be sleeping and resting. And then Sunday, it's just resting and recovering to repeat the following week. I don't know where. Just hydrate. I don't know where I can squeeze a relationship in during those 18 weeks, unless if I find that perfect woman that will, you know, be there for me during those 18 weeks. And of course, like she's going to like, there's going to be the turnaround. Yeah, of course I'll treat her wonderfully after that. We'll go out, uh, go back to Italy. Cause I freaking love going to Italy. Um, but I'm like, yeah, for those 18 weeks, I'm like, this is probably why I have to be single. I have to focus on training for that. And then for those 18 weeks, the less distractions, the better. Yeah. And it's not only that, like, you don't want to have like, you know, like I think Satan has his tactics too, where he could bring somebody into your life and just kind of deter you from your path. And, uh, uh, I feel like that's happened to me a few different times. Cause there's so many times that I've quit acting and didn't, couldn't like really see myself sustainably doing it. And then all of a sudden years later, I kind of look back on all these relationships that fell through countless. So I was always willing to give this up in order to just have a family. And then all of a sudden, now I have this, but no family, all things considering where it's like, all right, but where's like, where's it all going? You know, like, is it, was it really worth like, was it really, was it really worth all that trouble just to uh, get to this? Well, I always tell people it's not how you start. It's how you finish. So I say our stories aren't finished yet. We still are in that dash period of our lives. So when we come to the yeah. end, and firefighter see, taught me the dash. That's there's yeah. a poem called the dash. A firefighter taught me that. Please really? Yes. I, I didn't even know that. But yep. worse, our story is still being written. Like, and again, for those of you that are struggling out there, I would almost like if I were to talk to myself, I'd say just get ready for one of the most rewarding times of your life because you're gonna find out what you're really made of. And it's going to formulate into the person that you're ultimately meant to be. So like right now, I know you're kind of like me where, yeah, I want to find that special somebody. I would love to have a family, this and that. Like, I know you want to get married and have kids and all that, but yeah. you're still in that dash. It's still not over. You can meet somebody next week. You can meet somebody on set a month from now. You can meet somebody at a holiday party in December. In two years from now, you can be a father. Four years from now, you can be a father of three. Who knows? That's I, I why I have no doubt that's probably going to happen. And that's right. why every day, of course, I say, I, did, I always say how you start your day determines how your day is going to go. That's why I start my day off with prayer. And no matter how busy I am, I try to just read, even if it's a paragraph of the Bible, just start on a positive note. But I thank God every day that something good's going to happen. Today, this podcast is it. So now the rest of my day back. Oh, awesome. I'm really, I'm, I'm really glad uh, the timing worked out better uh, today than uh, the other day. And like, just to have like this conversation because it's actually really awesome getting to know you, man. Uh, Same like, here. Honestly, I, I didn't, I, I come in with low expectations cause uh, I wanted to, I want the conversation to just like, uh, I got the basics and um, I know how to just keep the like conversation going about you, the person, but what I really enjoy is the discoveries on what you find out about people, to be honest, and just having that depth. Like I had no idea about, you know, your, your faith, your background, uh, your Catholicism to Christianity, how you'd identify and just the journey it's been to get to this point. And now to now you're going to be a probie pretty soon. So that's like, that's pretty awesome, dude. I'm going to be a probie, which yeah, good, good on you for the correct term, by the way, I'm going to be a probie with one feature film that's going to be in theaters who owns his own business already with I got, so I, much more to come. Because I have to yeah. ask you about now you mentioned all max. So I guess just really quick, what is it? What, what do you do at all max? All max is a protein and supplement company that's been around for over 20 years. They're yes. a Canadian company. So one of the best things about them since they're a Canadian company and to get a supplement made and sold in Canada is 20 times harder than it is in the U S what's in their labels is actually in there because they, <laughs> yeah, because they wouldn't make some to sell in Canada, but not in America or make some in America to not sell in Canada, vice versa. So sure. my job is to, 
actively manage all of the active accounts that range from Pennsylvania to Maine. Like I got, like when I check my phone again, maybe I've gotten a couple emails for some accounts that need to place an order. That's great. It's part of me to keep people up to date on current specials, current deals. It's also part of my job to visit set accounts. But again, it's all on my own time. Like this Friday, gosh, that's tomorrow already. Geez, I'm doing yeah, a tomorrow. road trip, road trip out to Pennsylvania because I haven't been there for a while visiting my accounts out there. And it's part of my job to create new accounts. Basically, anybody that owns a nutrition shop, supplement shop, gym, or a health food store, or anybody that's just like, hey. Yeah, I want to sell supplements. How do I get them? I'm your guy. Right. So with Allmax, that's what I do. It's a blessing. I might be going out to Vegas next month for the Mr. Olympia. And to be able to say I'm going Yo. to the Mr. Olympia for work. I did last year. I had that surreal moment where, again, I got the job at Allmax last week of September of 2023. Week after that, the bosses called me. Hey, Joe, uh, we got to get your flight info because you wa we want you to come to the Olympia to work. I'm like. Okay, great. I've been to the Mr. Olympia before as a fan. So as I'm at the Olympia behind the booth, giving people our product, I had that surreal moment where I see people coming up to get samples and to get stuff or whatever, thinking, I used to be them going to get the samples, attending the Olympia. And then I look, I'm like, now I'm on the other side of the table. I'm sure. working it. Mm -hmm. I'm with one of the best supplement companies in the world. It's like, how did I get here? I'm like, thank you, God. This is incredible. If you ever, if you never, if you ever need a former athlete, actor, guy who's doing a boxing movie to plug in your your stuff, I will definitely uh, try to uh, put that in, like, like in the scene. I'll sneak it in. I'm chewing on that bar. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, dude, I got protein bars. Next time I see you, man, I got a whole closet full of supplements. Again, one are, of the many. Perks are you busy I have. on? Since you're in the Hudson Valley, are you busy on September twelfth? September 12th. No. I'm so, not. uh, we're, do, we're, we're, uh, going to, uh, Hudson TV's mashup. Um, they're doing, uh, another mixer, uh, for everybody in the industry here in the Hudson Valley. It's called Hudson TV. Great people. They're on Instagram, but at RMV sellers free entry on September 12th from 5 PM to 8 PM in West park, New York, RSVP for free, but people just show up. Uh, I, I went last time. I had a great time, shook a lot of hands, met a few casting directors. Uh, they're all coming back for uh, the end of the summer mashup on September the 12th from five to eight. I think it's a, I want to say a Wednesday or a Thursday night, but regardless, I'm, I'm it's, going. Uh, um, yes. Count me in. I will be there. I just wrote it down. Just send me the address, but uh, I get, I'll follow you on Instagram. You got Joe yeah. Barra Instagram. Yes. It's actually Joe J Barra B Barra's with two R's. Gotcha. Added going to. Yeah. So covered um, fitness. Wow. I gotta, I, I, I do gotta just ask you really quick because I, I did look up uh, your resume and it looks like it's a soldier for Christmas. Can you uh, uh, plug that in and talk about that? Oh, absolutely. So, a soldier for Christmas, it's a Hallmark esque Christmas movie. I say esque because it's not going to be on the Hallmark Network, with a right. touch of a faith based element in there. It's a story about a soldier who couldn't really be in a relationship because his life is the army, meeting the love of his life by unconventional circumstances. She was coming from a place where her husband was a soldier who died. So it took her a while to get back on the market and sure. without spoiling much, just after wave after wave of bad dates, we finally match. Yeah. And I don't want to say anymore because I don't want to spoil the film, but I am very blessed to have starred in it. The director, once again, Aaron Greer, shout out to you, Aaron. Yeah, um, I see him. He's a man with a bold vision. Um, he's, and again, Aaron's somebody who I've been keeping in my prayers since I've met him when we filmed Watchers back in 2021. And I had a very good phone call with him a couple weeks ago. And it seems like our schedules are going to be busy the next couple of years, which is a very good thing, which again is a testament to the power of prayer. And yeah, that's also what, that's why I tell people, no matter where you're at, be your best, be your best because your talent will shine and people of recognition will recognize you only say that I'll make this story quick. When I was filming watchers with Aaron, I was on location in Michigan. This was in 2021. He flew a select actor, select few actors from Los Angeles to combine with some local hires from Michigan. So 
me and one of my best friends, Kevin Porter, who's one of the best actors I've ever worked with and a great mentor. Um, we were, and I'm not tooting my own horn. We were a consummate professional showed up on time, no egos did more than what was asked of us. Never spoke up. There was a couple other actors from LA and part of my French, but they showed their ass. They acted like prima donnas were late, constantly gossiping and complaining where I'm like, damn, take the victory. You're starring in a series that can lead to a season two. Yeah. And because of my behavior on Watchers, it led to that phone call I told you about uh, two years later, where then suddenly I was the lead in the feature film, which will now lead to Aaron and I working on multiple projects together. So you never know. And that's saying you yeah. never know what's going to happen based on one project. I'm literally living it right now. You truly do never know. Well, where can people watch uh, The Watchers? That I will have more information on probably sometime uh, next month. Aaron's currently working on distributors. I know it's going to get a limited theatrical release. So What? Really? Yeah, I will have more updates on that uh, later this month. I wish I had more now. I apologize. If he wants to put episode one in the Triborough Film Festival, I know a guy. I'll let him know. Absolutely. Well, so Soldier for Christmas is a feature, but Watchers possibly for uh, season why not? two. Yeah. Yeah, why you know, not? I'll let him know. Absolutely. No, we got a couple of like TV pilots that uh, they want to premiere that that episode inside the uh, Triborough Film Festival. And uh, I've had producers from Universal, from Sony, uh, word of mouth through the Chamber of Commerce, because apparently they all know each other. That was that was funny what happened last year. But uh, no, like people show up, especially to the awards ceremony. They all want to know, like, where can we watch your movie? All that stuff like that. That's wow. what the whole mixer at the Astro Award ceremony is for. So, well, I will definitely I... after this, I'm going to reach out to him and I'll bring that to his attention. I would he'd probably love to bring Soldier for Christmas to the Triborough Film Festival. Well, is there already like a premiere date? Um, cause not yet. The, the, fest From what the I, festival's yeah. not until January. So if it's ready, oh, yeah. please. It's, like... uh, yeah. The, the premiere is going to happen sometime in November. So I think oh. timing of that would be perfect. Oh, so you got a special screening for all you guys that you're going to do in the city. So, so far, he plans on them having us all back in Grand Rapids for a red carpet for a premiere. And it's, it's going right. to be showing in December. So yeah, that'll actually be good timing. Nice. See, again, Are you Look how good look how good God is. Look how great life works. Well, I want I want I want to keep God on the conversation before we wrap things up. Are you strapped for time? Not at all. All right. So I first I wanted to ask, like, hey, thank you so much. So your first feature that was uh, the Soldier for Christmas? Technically, no. That was the first feature that's coming out. First gotcha. feature I did, which seems like it's just in production hell, is called Trading Souls. <laughs> Which is I'm gonna, look, um, I'm gonna look that up. I got your was, resume. I'm, st I'm stalking you so hard right now. <laughs> stalk me, please. Actually, it's so funny. Um, I'm not gonna name her name, but there's this waitress, and again, we got along so great. Would have been an ideal lady I would have loved today, but it's one of those where she's in a relationship. But I don't think it's going the best. When yeah. I went to the diner last time, she's like, "I googled you. You're very impressive. You got a great room." Like, wow, I'm kind of <laughs> impressed. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Soldier for Christmas I booked because I went to an open audition. Somebody, and again, I was working as a PA on a set, and someone's like, hey, there's this feature film that's doing an open audition. I'm like, I'm not going to go. But right. again, and I, to bring it back to God, when God's talking, you're going to hear this like still small voice in your gut and feel like I should do this. So yeah, I felt that. Didn't know it was God at the time, but I'm like, let me go to this open audition. Ended up booking the lead. And it's a modern day Freaky Friday. We supposedly wrapped um, in 2022. But again, and this isn't to throw any shade at anybody. The director, she is phenomenal. Her name is Christina Cooper, a badass and a force. And I hope to work with her again soon. But, you know, from the producer side of it, I just don't know what's happening. It's one of those things where I kept hearing, oh, it's coming out. Yeah, we're going for Jude. We're going for end of summer. We're going for this. I'm like, man. Just release a damn thing already. So I get it. that was technically the first feature film. I mean, I'm in another one, which actually I got a message of director. It's called Kyle's Pocket Dial, where it's a rom-com that's very Curb Enthusiasm-esque in a way where okay. the director just sort of told us, here's what I want to happen. And me and the other actress, Britt Crisp, is who is phenomenal, by the way, just improv 
most of the film. Yes, I came with its challenges too, but um, had so much fun filming that Michael Baumgarten is a director. Great man, phenomenal director. Hope to work with him again soon. That's set to release later this year. That's, I think, one of the posters I sent you. And I'm also, I'm not, I don't have a lead role in this one, but I'm in Legend of the White Dragon, which is the Bat in the Sun feature film that stars the late Jason David Frank. That, again, is one of those films that's been promised to release earlier, but it's just been indefinitely delayed till we hope this year. They got to update know. your IMDb, at least like get you saying in development or production or rumored or something. But like, like I see you got some really good credits and I'm like, where the heck are these? Like the last couple ones you mentioned, I'm like, I want to look them up. But yeah, you know what? I probably should, I, I should get an IMDb pro and manually update it myself. I'm just lazy. You got it. <laughs> I do had to do it. It's uh, it's not, it's not a bad tool. And it's like, it's less than a cell phone bill for the year. Like you're not, you're not losing money for having that and making it look nice. <laughs> No, it's, I'd say it's worth it because uh, you do have the ability to actually access a producer if you have an original idea. It's like, hey, I really liked what you did on these shows. I have something that you might be interested in down, down in the future. I'd love to work with you. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Would you, like to yeah, take, that, would you like to check it out? I guess that's something, honestly. So I'm not sure because I know, you know they say a lot of actors should write. I was one of those guys that was like, no, I'm not a writer. But after my breakup happened, I sort of turned that into a script. It's an okay yeah. script, um, but then, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it's okay. It was like my first one. I think it's decent. Could definitely use some more touching, but there's another one I wrote where it combines my breakup, a part of my breakup story with my insane bachelor party experience in Nashville last year my for my cousin's wedding, not mine. That's still, that's cool. And I amped it up, of course, with some Hollywood flair as you have to. And sure. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty damn proud of this script. I finished the first draft like uh, two months ago. So I've, it's been sitting. I'm going to visit it again very soon just to look at it again. But yeah, it's like there's like, that's just something I bet. Like, huh, this can definitely be something. We got to do a reading, man. Just got to get the AFC involved and be like, hey, let's read it and see what works and doesn't work. I would love to do that. Absolutely. We do it all the time. No, it's oh, very common. We, ha we got beautiful. a lot. We got a lot of we got a lot of stories on the desk we do beautiful let's read it because i need help coming up with a name for it because a working title which i'm not calling it this is called nashville bash horrible name again not calling it that's just the placeholder nash bash nash bash is kind of cool actually yeah that's kind of cool i'm not hating that i like that actually but yes <laughs> let's schedule i would love to schedule that you mentioned earlier uh the the chosen how long you've been keeping it up with that Oh man, let me tell you, I freaking love that show, man. Um, that was one of those shows. My mom was like, "You gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch it." I'm like, "I'm not gonna watch a religious show because you know, for the most part, they were bad. They were poorly done, poorly acted, so cheesy. It's like a miracle happens and the heavens open up, a choir sings. I'm like, God's is... not dead. Yeah, I'm like, this is such BS. No kidding. No so, kidding. Thank so God I for was, this movie. So, <laughs> so I was. I was hesitant to watch The Chosen because of this. Yeah. But, you know, during COVID, when I ran out of stuff to watch, and I was going through this faithful transformation, someone else told me about it. Um, Someone else in the community was like, gotta watch this show. They're like, start from episode three, because the first two can be pretty slow. So I did, and I'm like, well, this actually is pretty good. Like directing is phenomenal. The cinematography is phenomenal. The soundtrack, the actors are great. And then when Christ would perform his miracles, I'm like, oh, this is like normal. But yeah. what I love about the show is it's telling Christ's story in a believable way. Yeah. In a way where you can watch that show. And this is what I love about The Chosen, where they're turning millions of people into believers or making them read the Bible because you can watch that show and think, this happened. This is yeah. real. And then what I tell people, if you don't believe in God, or even if you don't say you believe in Christ, if there's 1% of you that doubts, that believes that this could probably be real, visit that. Because if your 1% is actually true, and Christ is in fact real, which of course we believe he is, do you understand what that means and how powerful that is? And this show is doing the greatest job that we've ever seen to bring millions of people to that realization. And as an actor, 
I'm at the point in my career where I want to do stuff that people are going to remember, things that are going to last, that they're going to watch for years on the road and say, this show helped me with this. The Chosen, I've been praying about it since season three. I'm like, I need to be on this show. And of course, you watch the show. You don't see many white, blue-eyed, red facial-haired, brown-haired individuals. I have a very unique complexion, but that was the, that was Jesus in King of Kings, bro. That was a ginger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. But the show, you know, to, and I love it. You know, they were in Jerusalem. They're in the Middle East. So yeah. of course, everybody's like, looks Middle Eastern in that show, except for the Romans. So I'm like, maybe I could be one of the Romans that's treating Christ horribly in season six, one of his persecutors. And make it look so good that people sympathize with him and want to believe him more. I don't, I, I just, I pray to God and I thank you him already in advance. Yeah, I could be Greek too. Absolutely. You could, totally, you could totally be Greek. I'm just like, I need to be a part of this show. Well, actually, need... there's a woman uh, on one of our previous podcasts. Uh, her name is Jennifer Bangs. Beautiful. Yeah, what a great conversation. If you look up any of the AFC podcast, uh, look up Jenny Bangs. Um, she was on last season. So she's actually, that, really yeah. good, she's actually really good friends with one of the producers on The Chosen. And of course, I've reached out being like, hey, I will literally do background just to be a part of this. So please well, let me know. You could do background for it because background, it's all free. It's all like you know, the background actors, they volunteer their time, which yeah. I love because they put more production to the show. I thought about doing that, too. But I'm like, no, I want to be front and center featured in some capacity. I did. They had an open casting call for season three. And yeah, it was only Roman soldiers that I could audition for. And then when I watched it, I'm like, you know, maybe I'm glad I didn't get it right now because it was going to be a more important Roman soldier role later on that I want. And something I want everybody to understand. It took me a long time to get to this realization because, you know, when, when you are an aspiring actor, filmmaker, anything in the arts, you want it to happen now. You're like, oh man, yeah. Like, for me, I graduated college at 24, thinking, oh my gosh, at 25, I'm going to sign with an agent. I'm going to book these movies, TV shows, make millions of dollars. I'm going to get so many comics signed by Stan Lee. I'm a big nerd. I'm going to go to Comic-Con, <laughs> spend $40,000, get this great car, get this great place, treat my ex like royalty. Sometimes, if you're blessed with the blessing you want too early, the blessing's a burden. Because had I got blessed, this is me personally, had I got blessed with what I wanted to, at the time I wanted it, I would have spent my money stupidly, except for the Stan Lee signed comics. I still think that would have been great. I have four, would have had a whole lot more. Um, but I would have spent all of my earnings, not only foolishly, but on the wrong woman. And I wouldn't have been the person of faith I am now. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Right. So you got on this is where, that's why you got to trust God's plan and realize not on your time on his time. Like yes, I want to be on the chosen so freaking bad. I know. But I, I would I would literally like, take the Roman who uh whips Christ 40 times. I'll, I'll take that role. You and me both. Yeah. Um one of us might have that role. Who knows? One of us might have a future part in season 5. Fingers no, season 5 already got done filming. Well, they season just finished six, 5. Yeah. Season six and then possibly seven. Um, I actually met one of the actors, Noah, who plays Andrew in the show. I saw him at LA Fitness. Oh, I did you really? Him. Yeah, and I recognized him. Oh my God. And man, that cool. I'm like, I'm like, I know this guy. And I hate approaching people in a gym because the gym to me is sacred. You're working out, but right. the show is like... one of my favorite shows. So yeah. I went up, I said, you play Andrew in the chosen one. He's like, yes. I'm like, oh my gosh. I thanked him so much. He was such a nice guy. I'm couldn't sure have been, he loves to talk about that show, man. Couldn't have been more nice, more down to earth. And um, yeah, like I just found out a lot and it made me love the show even more. Cause I'm like, you know, you meet some people they could be cold or whatever, but I'm like, this guy was so humble, so down to earth, had nothing but like, like a giving nature. And it just makes me want to be a part of that show more just to, see all these meet all of these actors and just hear their story and of course for those of you that didn't watch the jonathan rumi documentary on amazon prime go see it I, trust I me great... i i remember it was like a friday night i got I supposed to hang out with a girl didn't happen feeling down <laughs> on myself i was like let me watch this documentary 
It's so powerful. Jonathan's yeah. relationship with Christ. I mean, of course, goes without saying that he's doing a perfect portrayal of him. But that's why when I went, when he talked about his surrender and how he got that same day, three financial miracles that shouldn't have happened. I look yeah. back on my life and relate heavily to that. And Jonathan Rumi, you know, he's, I think in his forties, he's yeah. been in the game longer than me, longer than us. Yeah. And, you know, had much arguably more of a hard time, but now look at him again. You wonder why, when you're not blessed with something too early, blessing can be a burden. Imagine if Jonathan Rumi in his early thirties was blessed with a thriving acting career. Would he have been yeah. in the chosen? I don't Maybe know. Not, no, probably I can't, not. I can't picture anyone else playing Jesus. And you got to wonder, no. like, that's that was God's plan for him. So that's why, again, to everyone out there, trust God, trust his timing, and realize if you're not getting what you want right now, you're probably not ready, and it's for the better that you don't. Yeah, to that point, because, like, um, as an actor, like, uh, we're given tools on personalization, uh, emotional memory, all like, all these little things that actually help contribute to the character we portray. Wouldn't it serve you better, to a certain extent, if you actually experience something similar to the character that you are portraying? Because there's a lot of roles that just haven't been written for you yet. And leading up until those times, whether you turn 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, because this is a lifetime career. This is not an overnight thing. This is a lifetime commitment. All those, all that dash time in between, you have to actually go through something that only you could possibly endure that God could actually trust you to portray the character because everything under the sun definitely belongs to him. And oh, whether or not you 100%. give him the credit, that's on you, you know? Absolutely. But you know, God blesses you. And I feel like it's our job when God does bless us. And people ask, like, you're asking me right now, how'd you get to where you're at? And, you know, a part of me was like, oh, I know how, because again, and we talked about this earlier, I know how people are in this industry. I'm like, oh, should I tell him that, you know, faith's a big part of my life? But I'm like, I owe it to God. And if he chooses yeah. not to talk about it, fine, whatever. Because I'm not going to shove it down people's throats. But is do you think God's going to keep blessing you if you're not giving him credit? Welcome to Happy Corner. This project strives to make safe housing areas for stray cats at an affordable price. It's so easy to put together that even your children could have fun making one. Help keep cats and other animals safe with their own little happy corner homes. You can help this project become a reality by donating to the GoFundMe page. Happy corner homes are a great way to show those animals in need. It's okay to be happy. Hey, I honestly, I that's that that's I don't know if that's open to debate, but it's just like it's tough. It's tough. It's a, I think it's a little tough because we're because uh, when it, when we look at the story of the Bible and we look at all of these quote unquote characters and people, we're, we're only understanding as uh, first as the from the perspective of the reader. It's really tough, especially now, two thousand years later, to really put yourself in their shoes. You know, because the culture is completely different, the time is completely different. We have Wi-Fi. Uh, they they probably had they probably had dirt, and they were well grounded into the earth, and the, all all everything and far and in between. Totally different species, totally different everything. We're like a totally different breed of human beings. But it's like, where where in the Bible did they just not say grace at the dinner table? And they still like the story still ended the way it did. Where in the Bible does it really show? Like, regardless of whether or not you confess and give the glory to God, that regardless, it would have actually changed the outcome of the story. I never really thought about that. But I think here we are now. And as the reader, like modern day saints, like we're the we're the we're the messengers now. We can we can only speak on behalf of this, like of the things that we've actually endured to really give a test and a testimony to our faith. Right. And hope that it actually just just waters the seed for people to maybe uh, give it a try. Absolutely. And, you know, go, it's funny going back on that. I heard a powerful preacher say this, you're never given a testimony without a test. I hate so, it. So, so, Oh, I do. I, I hate mean, it I... too. When I, when I think back at my lowest moment, hell no, I want to go through that. Are you kidding? But it was necessary for me to build this faith and this love I have for Christ. And I'm going to share, I got to share this one quick story of an angelic moment in my life. So again, I don't, I don't know how much time you had too, but this point, 
was two months after the breakup. My two aunts have passed. And this is when I found out my ex may have potentially been cheating on me. It's January of 21. This was the day after my second aunt's funeral. And, you know, funerals one aren't easy, but I loved her dearly. My aunt Lena, God rest her soul. And I'm at the funeral trying not to cry, but I see my cousins, their girlfriends with them, people's wives with them. Knowing that I had somebody who loved me, who I could have, I could have used a shoulder to cry on that day, having nobody driving home with tears in my eyes. This was a Saturday. So the following Sunday, I go to my church and keep in mind, it's the peak of the second wave of COVID. We're all masked up. I go into my Catholic church. I'm in my hometown at this point in New York. And I'm not listening to what the priest is saying because I'm talking to God, kind of like what you are. I'm talking to him angrily. I'm saying, God, what the hell is wrong with you? Again, I'm like, I've given my life to Christ. And since then, I've lost two aunts. Since then, I found out my ex may have been potentially cheating on me. I dread going to sleep every night because not only can't I sleep, but I don't want to dream about her. I dread waking up because it's another day without her. Because I was in my hometown, every single day to just do a 10 minute drive would take me an hour. Cause yeah, you know, I had my creepy ex-boyfriend moment where I would try to see if she was maybe at Walmart, maybe at this store, maybe at this store. Yeah. I was tired of it. And I knew I wasn't living. I was just simply existing and going through the motions kind of like yourself. So I'm talking to God, I'm saying, this isn't me. I don't know. I wasn't suicidal, but I was pushed to a point of extremity where I was going to do something drastic. And I was telling God this. Yeah. And as I'm talking to him, I didn't realize this was a whole hour and people were already leaving church. So I realized I had to get up and leave because they were, you know, just cleaning the pews for the next service. And I'm praying to myself, mind you. Then I apologized. I said, God, I'm sorry for praying at you for being angry but you got to give me a sign. Lord, please just tell me I'm going to be okay. So I stand up and a second after I stood up, I feel somebody tap me on my shoulder. I turn around and this man who I never met before looks me in the eyes. And again, we're wearing masks. So I don't know what he looks like underneath that thing. Yeah. He says, young, young man, I don't know who you are, but God sees you and hears you and he's not ignoring you. He's going to bless you in ways you cannot believe. So I'm shocked. I'm trying not to break down in tears in front of the stranger. I'm just like, excuse me, what are you talking about? He's like, I could tell, you know, you're a special guy. You're probably young in your late twenties and you're coming to church by yourself. He's like, I see it. God sees it. He's going to bless you in ways you cannot believe. So I look at him. I'm like, what's your name? As we're walking out, he's like, my name is George said, George, my name is Joe, and you have no idea how much I needed to hear this. So I said, I'm going to keep praying for you, George. He's like, Joe, I'm praying for you too. Trust me, God's got you. As soon as I got in my car, I turned it on. I was listening to the Billy Graham station on Sirius Radio. Shout out to Billy Graham. Love that man. And the first thing out of his mouth that he was preaching on, he says, God puts angels on earth to talk to you, which is a direct voice from heaven. It's his word on earth. I froze. I couldn't move. So sure. I just, I thought, oh my gosh, I think I just talked to an angel. So I was excited. Next Sunday, I go back to church, same time. I'm like, let me find George. I knew what he looked like with a mask on. He was a bald old man, but he wasn't there. Nor the following Sunday, nor the following Sunday. And then I eventually went back to California. Yeah. And whenever, whenever I think of George, I just see a mask and a bald head that's it. So I tell that story. It's an integral part of my testimony because again, when I was at, every time I keep saying my lowest, it, yeah, one of my lowest moments, I didn't go to the alcohol in my house. I didn't, you know, try to like harm myself at first. I didn't call somebody which, you know, I'm not saying not to call people, call your friends, call family to help you through this dark time. Yeah, my don't go through anything alone if you could help it. No, I don't, I, I don't recommend it. I credit my best friends for help me during that time. They were my therapists. They were my rocks and I love them all. But my first response, I went to church and I prayed and I talked to God. 
I got an answer that day. Now, I'm not saying do this and you're going to get an angelic answer like me. I don't know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. But at your lowest point, when you cry out to God and Christ for help and you pray a deep, earnest prayer from your heart, I can guarantee you will get an answer. I don't know what it will be, but you will. It might not come in the form like mine did, but it happened to me. So I feel like it's my duty to share it because the same thing could happen to you. Who knows? No, oh, we can. And not only that, it, you're, it's going to come to a point where you're the guy approaching somebody in distress. Absolutely. You pay it forward. You see somebody you or you've, you, you feel that inkling of like, you, maybe I should talk absolutely. to this person, talk yeah. to them. You know, there was, um, every time I would go back to that church, every time I'd go back to that church, you know, I had tears in my eyes and, you know, just certain, like some of the ushers just put their hands on my shoulder and just be like, don't worry, son, it's going to be okay. Yep. Like, and just that little bit, like it was just, it, helps. It, was, it was a dark time in my life, but it was such a beautiful time in my life as well, because I've seen God's personal hand in my life so many times during that time when I was, you know, again, when I was in uncharted territory where I was for the first time in my life, ashamed to say it, but in a state of depression. Mm -hmm. but that's yeah. Uh, that's the other. Th yeah, I could totally. Re well, I'm still. In, I'm. I'm not in. I wouldn't say I'm depressed anymore. I'm just like. You know. You know what Master Yoda said about fear leads to anger. Anger leads. Anger to leads hate. to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Yes, I have a lightsaber in my room. Okay, so one nerd to a dude. So, like, there, there's always a point where you are suffering. But I think in order for you to actually get back to that space of faith, uh, there is like a full circle moment because suffering does lead to like the measure of your faith, the, your testimony, all that stuff. And suffering could actually be a useful tool. But in order to actually get back to that faith point, more or less, to get back to that side of the spectrum, if you are suffering, you actually have to go back to the, that hate and go to the step before and you have to lead yourself back down that path from going to hate, going back to anger and going back to fear. I think what I've discovered is that like I was at a, a potluck and a dear friend of like the community and well, Conrad, awesome dude. Like we talked a little bit more this year, like out of the last five years where you're starting to like put real like pieces together of my story and my background and all that stuff. Cause you're going to learn something new about me. If you don't listen to the podcast, basically um, he really said, you can't be angry anymore. You got to stop being angry. I know that I'm angry. I'm pissed. Uh, like as an Italian, like when I'm angry, I stay angry. And I really I'm Italian too, brother. Fight. I get it. I know I don't look so, it, but I am. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, but I, I get, I, I understand why, and man, I guess it is like a blood disability type of thing where it's just like, you get like, that's like, that's your fight. You're, you're chosen Italian and that's just, you're a hot blooded dude. And I'm also part, part Irish. So I'm already going to be like very snippy and snappy and uh, diggity but I could actually feel that the suffering, the hate, like I, I had to, I had to overcome that. And the anger part is where I'm on the back end of where it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to be angry. I don't like the circumstances and closure that I've never got to really overcome, but it's like, you got to just trust God now, you know, it's not really for you to just interpret the the word or try to like find scripture more or less that only applies to you, but you have to accept it for what it is. And that's part of the grieving process. And I just haven't really finished more or less that artistically trying to get that out with the writing that we do. And, you know, as an actor, you're holding on to all that juice. Cause you're going to, you got like, whether it's on the, the MMA mat or in front of a camera, you're going to be using a lot of this stuff. But I'm just kind of going through this pendulum, little, little annoying little cycle that it's just, that's, what's making me angry at this point is that I just want to be, I want to be a normal guy. I never yeah. expected going down this path of theater to film actor, losing my career, uh, regaining a different career, all this stuff would just be this, you know, like we were saying before about destiny and all that stuff with, uh, Joseph, I, I having a heads up would have been nice about a lot of things, you know, but I, kn I know that I probably would have been, I'll, I'm going to pass had I had any of that data, you know, all of us wouldn't. 
And that's why God doesn't show you what it's going to take to get to your ultimate destiny, because we all would have bowed out, not even halfway through. We all would have. I think there was one thing where it's just like, uh, I'm going to, um, what were you saying before about like uh, uh, being made something in the presence of my enemies? Oh, um, God blesses you with a table before your enemies or blesses you in the presence of your enemies. I feel like that happened to me as a result of not dissolving the Astoria Filmmakers Club. I was going to say, how could it not? You were like, I, you were to tell me all the blessings in your life. And I'm like, I know your yeah. ex-wife's got to have heard about this and been like, shit. She was never my enemy. It was really a lot of people in the community that were just like really against it. Like you, you like, like, bro, like mind your business. Some people would go out of the way to try to fucking sabotage it. And I'm like, Oh, and like, I, I, I know you shouldn't beat the living shit out of people necessarily as a New Yorker. That's my first impulse. And as a mature adult, that's my second or third impulse. But isn't it kind of interesting is that that's sort of like a requirement that had Joseph not opened his fat mouth and told his brothers, guess what? They never would have done what they did. And it's almost like it's almost like there's a book called The Necessity of an Enemy, I think by Robert Carpenter or something like that. Great book that talks about how God allows all these things to happen, that even though they seem bad, he's going to flip them over and make and pretty much make it in your favor and good. But that's part of the process. You know, that's what it, it is. Takes. It is. And it's a shitty part and something yeah. shittier that I'll tell you, too. The bigger your struggles, the bigger your destiny. Sounds cliche. Sounds you might be like, yeah, OK, it is true. Because, you know, if you were to tell me I would have had to go through three and a half years of what I did, I would have said, fuck that. Let me just yeah. take this easy way. Let me be content. But knowing where I'm at now and where I'm going to be. In the next year from now, two, three, four, five years from now, you know, I couldn't be more excited. Right. I couldn't be more eager to see what God has planned. And I cannot wait to see who the love of my life is that God has planned. But just again, to like recap it, because I know now we've been talking for a while. I would not have gotten to where I'm at. I give God, I give Jesus Christ the credit. Because to summarize all this, at my darkest moment, in my deepest despair, when I thought there was no way out, when I couldn't see in front of me, because all I saw was depressions and death and accidents, financial loss and troubles, the one thing I kept doing was I kept my faith. I kept praying. I kept reading the Bible. I kept, I understood the scriptures in a different way, listening to sermons every day saying, thank you, God, that something good's going to happen to me today. I even said that on the day I got into my car accident. I said that on the day my ex broke up with me. I said that on the day my Nona died. But here I am three and a half years later, future firefighter, actor with a lead uh, with a feature film coming out later this year and a business owner working for one of the best supplement companies on God's green earth. Once again, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that so. because God was that good to me and just wait till you see what he does in my life in these next couple of years. And we're going to circle back and definitely bring it back on the podcast to talk about it. And I hope to be a part of that process and see it all happen before my oh, eyes. I really brother, will. after today, you will be. I don't see how you wouldn't be at this point. I, I'm I'm really excited uh, for you. And uh, I, I, I got to say thank you for coming on the AFC podcast. I think this was a very this was a very nice one, something I definitely personally needed. Uh, I guess uh, before uh, we wrap things up. Um, I did want to ask you, though, uh, do, have you felt a dynamic or difference between uh, being an L.A. actor versus a New York based actor? One hundred percent. Absolutely. Because L.A. and it might sound like I'm talking shit about L.A. I will even talk about the differences real quick with how people were striking in L.A. When, I, when people were striking in L.A., they're holding the picket signs. But and I would see such fan. I saw Brian Cranston on the picket line, who, yeah. by the way, Brian Cranston, one of the nicest guys on planet Earth. Love him to death. One of my favorite actors. And after meeting him, just all the more better. But most of the people were striking in L.A. saying, oh, what are you going to do after this? I'm going to go to the gym. I think I'm going to go shopping. I think I'm going to do this. I don't know. When I moved to New York, <laughs> I'm like. I'm like, let me strike in New York, see what it's about. They're holding signs. They're walking around circles. They're like, we're a union city. We're not going to stand for this. I'm like, 
New Yorkers want something out of this. LA, they're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to strike to post on Instagram. Look, we're striking hashtag SAG after strike. <laughs> oh my God. Not in New York. <laughs> so that get. one of the biggest differences ever um, in LA, you get people looking for what I call the bigger, better deal, which leads to the fake reputation. Meaning like you're an awesome down to earth person, a faith-based person. That's why I now consider you a friend in my life. A person from California is like, oh my gosh, they work for the Astoria Filmmakers Club. Yes, he can introduce me to so and so. He can introduce me to so and so. I'm going to go to this. Oh, this per geez. I can get this out of this person. That's and sad, the, man. And then the second you're like, oh no, wait, I actually can't do this. Never mind. They'll be like, they're just going to fade from your life and go to someone else that can offer them what you promised them instead of saying the bigger, better deal. Yeah, instead of saying, oh my gosh, look at this genuine gem of a human being that I was blessed to meet another person in film and faith, which is rare to find. They're like, Oh no, this person doesn't know this person. This person that I met today knows this person. So part of my French, fuck them. I'm going to cancel my plans with them and go hang out with this person instead. When in New York, yes, people say, Oh, New Yorkers are mean. No, we're real. If we don't like you, or if we're going to say no, I'm not going to say yes. And then back out at the last second. Cause that's still a no. I'm going to tell you, Sorry, no, I can't do it. That's just some of the differences between an LA based actor and a New York based actor. Where would where do you recommend everybody go? Or uh, it, does it all depend? Or it's just like <laughs> I'll I'll be honest. If you don't have a car, if you have no mode of transportation, go to New York because yeah. New York makes it super convenient for you to travel. And despite the rumors you heard, New York is a lot safer. A subway fare is $2.90 one way, and gas Los and gas in Los Angeles is $6.50 a gallon. So you can Fuck only off. fathom, so you can only oh fathom God. what Uber fares and stuff cost. And also because if you live in New York City, you can get to the airport without having to take ride share because again New York is super fucking convenient and yeah. you you can audition from anywhere so say anywhere. you do book you do book something in la guess what take the subway to queens take the bus to jfk then boom you go to la if you book something in la that films in new york good luck catching an uber at three o'clock in the afternoon to lax <laughs> not happening bro not happening at all also oh in God. new yorkers the people you meet will be your friends for life in la the people you meet more than likely will be your friends for a season until you've outlived your usefulness to them so move to New York. Oh my God. I'm, I'm so relieved and like, wow. At the same time, <laughs> have, thank you so much for sharing that because I've always had a desire to like, maybe if I ever did go to LA, I wouldn't be in this position. I would actually have a career, yada, yada. And of course I would go to Los Angeles for work and traveling sales or uh, something would bring me to LA. I got family in Burbank, um, but I just, it didn't have that. It didn't have that. It, di it didn't something, something just di didn't spark, you know, or something just mm -hmm. didn't actually, you would have to force yourself to do it is basically what it felt like to me is that I have to force. It didn't felt called to do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And now, yes, it might sound like I'm shit talking LA as a whole, but I met some no, people it's, out in LA. It's a, um, I, yeah, it's, it's a dynamic. That's it's all. The, I just want it's the general view. There's a strong faith-based community out there in LA the churches out there are phenomenal. I oh, was, I'm, I'm proud to say I volunteered for Harvest Church with Greg Laurie. I helped their baptisms. I got baptized by Calvary Chapel in Burbank. Phenomenal people. I met some great friends out there, but everything that I was talking about is the average. So yes, I was out there for eight years. So of course, eventually I met some real good people. Right. It took a long time, but I did eventually. So that's not me to say, hey, if it's in your heart, definitely go try it. But just be prepared because, yeah, be prepared to spend a lot of money. The dollar doesn't go far. And, yeah, just be on the lookout. I'm really glad. I just want I wanted to finish up on that note on the faith based in Los Angeles or out in California, because I like from from an outsider's perspective, unless you're amongst it, you could probably have a misunderstanding on the interpretation of it, because like you said, New York is probably a lot safer than it might appear than it would from an outside point of view. But I, I just based on everything I kind of saw and witnessed in Los Angeles or just California, like being a Christian was not a good idea. Like you might as well, you, like, 
you might as well have been um you might as well open up a synagogue in downtown Manhattan or a mosque in downtown Manhattan where it's just like not a good idea. Did uh you ever get a chance to listen to uh Angela and Ariel from Girls Gone Bible? You know, my agents here in New York told me about them. And yeah, all right, man. I looked them up. They're two beautiful, beautiful human beings. Actors. Who yeah. I would love to date, but they live in LA <laughs> and I just left LA and I ain't doing a, the reverse long distance that I did before, but they're Facts. phenomenal people. If they're right. listening or have an inkling of this, Hey, we're still single and we're faith-based actors just on I the don't hate, side of the coast. And I don't hate women. I'm just going through stuff. If they do listen to this. Oh no, you know, no, I, like... <laughs> no, I don't think we both do. We're just venting no, our frustrations of modern dating. I, and not only that, where it's just like, uh, to that point, you know how unique it is for an actor to find somebody who has an understanding and respect for acting the way uh, Ariel and Angela might, or just women in general might, unless they actually experience it. They don't quite respect it or understand it or appreciate it. That's one. Two, the gender dynamic roles, and then there's Christianity, and then just modern day staying alive, staying alive, uh, culture and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, how do you find, like, like date, like it sucks finding a, it, it sucks dating. It does. It's so like, I don't, I, I have, I don't think I've done it in over a year to be quite honest. I don't even keep track of it anymore. Yeah. It, it, it's rough. It's rough out there. Like, it and especially it's harder when you're faith-based cause I'm not going to hide my faith. Like I'm going to, like, if you ask, I'm not going to shove it down your throat. Either. Like I'm not that guy that's on the street saying you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. That's not me. If it like when it, when it comes up, Oh yeah, I'm going to proudly say I like I'm a Christian and I believe in Christ. And yeah, when I was living in LA, um, yeah, I would tell people I would go to church. This is my grandfather's cross that I always wear. So even before I was, you know, as like, as faithful as I am now, I'd wear it. And I'll never forget. Somebody asked me, this moment stood out in my life, like, oh, you go to church. You don't like believe in Jesus, the whole thing, are you? They're not one of those Jesus, Jesus freaks, are you? And I was like, no, of course not. That's not me. That's not I'm me. Not, not at it's all. Different. But then I went home and I'm like, why do I just feel so wrong about like not telling him like, yeah, I believe in Christ and God. Like, why do I feel wrong? Cause you know, also in LA, yes, there's a faith-based community. It's very small. And yes, there's a Christian community. It's very small. The film industry ain't like that. A majority of it, you tell yeah. them you're a Christian or you wear, they see you wearing your cross proudly. They're going to look at you different. You're going to immediately get judged without them even knowing you as a quote unquote Jesus freak. And they're going to think you're, they might think you're insane. They might think, you know, you're out there, which again, Christ said that's all going to happen. So it shouldn't be a shock. So sure. it's another thing about LA. Like, yeah, but that was so a moment that stood out. And fabricated and it's more illusionary or just like, or is it like, I think I said this on a previous podcast. Like, do you think the problem is like maybe our perspective as an outsider on the glamour of it all or the idea oh, of something? 100%. The first thing everybody says, uh, whenever anybody visited me, like, take me to the Walk of Fame. I want to see the Chinese theater. I'm like, all right. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I take them there and they're like, wow, it's filthy. There's bums everywhere. The ground is dirty. But I'm like, look, there's a Hollywood sign. And yes, that's Grauman's Chinese theater where they have the best premieres. Like I thought it, everyone's like, why is it this dirty? I thought it'd be nicer. I'm like, they know how to clean it up for the red carpet and on movies. Oh but yeah. No, I'm sure it's hundred percent over glammed over like over height. And, but again, you are put in proximity where in LA, since it's an entertainment city, you're going to meet everybody. That's somebody's in the industry. Every other person you meet there, they're going to be in the industry. So yes, it's a great way to network great way to meet people and the friends that i've met out there they're my friends for life but good man having been in new york for yeah a year now and of course still have not done like everything i've wanted to still finding my way in the on the in the industry on this side of the coast i can already tell you it's been so rewarding it's been so great mm -hmm. and yeah, the people you meet, it's just, they're real. And even at my um, industry, at my uh, agent party uh, during the holidays, I didn't even know that they had a mixer. 
Um, but they had a mixer. And when I told her I moved from LA, they're like, oh gosh, they all said the same exact thing I said. And I'm like, wow, I thought it was just me. It's crazy. No, I do. And I'm so glad that, you know, Hey, I'm really glad that you and I are meeting right now. And of course the AFC, it's a small, small community, but we got about a thousand filmmakers on our Facebook group. So asking for help or people looking for help, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to find out one way or another. Uh, people are, I really hope that somebody contacts you in light of uh, this podcast. And if anybody wants to get in touch, what's the best way to do it? Oh, absolutely. If you want to get in touch with me, my Instagram is at Joe J Barra, B-A-R-R-A. Um, feel free to follow, reach out. My Facebook is Joe Barra. My father's is also Joe Barra. So make sure you look for the picture of me. Don't add my father. He's going to think you're insane. Um, <laughs> yeah, just reach out on social media. And if you want to connect, talk about anything, I'm always open to discussing my faith. So if there's just a question on that, please, gotcha. that's what God put me on this earth to do. Questions about projects or anything. Again, in the words of Motley Crue, my heart's like an open book for the whole world to read. It's from Home Sweet Home, by the way, the song. Wait a minute. Are you sure that's Motley Crue? 100%. Home Hold Sweet on, Home. No, wait a minute. Home Sweet Home. I'm on my way. Yes. Just set me free. Yep. Home sweet home. Oh, wait mm -hmm. a minute. It's oh, part of the that's main right. Course. In the beginning, there's no, other that's... lyrics. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I just for... I yeah. totally forgot yeah. because like I'm um, don't need nothing, but, but, good, but that's poison. Yes, but poison. that's uh, that's poison. But girls, girls, girls. That's Molly Crew Bible. I know. Oh, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, I'm a big '80s guy, man. I just I saw. I like the rock. Yeah. That was. I that saw was um, Journey and Sticks in July. Um, Yo, did you really? Yeah, uh, Saratoga. I saw I saw Sticks uh, live with, uh, uh, yes, uh, they uh, performed at Bethel Woods Art Center. In Sticks is phenomenal. My oh gosh, my they were so good. I also saw Skinner and ZZ Top at Bethel Woods. Phenomenal oh, as well. Oh, you did? Yeah. When was that in 2015, 16? That was last month. <laughs> you that was recently? Oh, come yeah. on. No, I know that. Oh, my God. Like, no, I haven't been to Bethel Woods in like since 2011 or 2012 but no that was awesome oh yeah i'm an oldies I, guy man like any music before the year 2000 i can name as soon as we get to 2000 and after i'm like music took a big nosedive in my opinion i think we live in a pre 9 11 post 9 11 world so like if, once you join the fire department you're gonna be you're, you're like is it was there anybody else in your family like first responder related in any way shape or form um, just an uncle of mine. He was a firefighter who did work on 9-11. So, all right, you got a little bit of a gateway into like the, the culture of the universe. Cause it is, it is, it's, it's not unhuman, but it is its own universe. It's its own thing, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, that's another reason why I created Fireland. So people get to know that universe and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, if you want to be a part of it, it's like, don't hesitate, man. I got, I, it's going to, it's going to be a show. <laughs> You let me know, you reach out, because now I can say, I, even the little experience I have, I do have experience. I, I sh I'll show you what I, I'll show you what I wrote and what our plan is, because we got to shoot the sizzle reel sometime in the next four months or else that's it. We might as well we, just tap out. Seems like we got a lot to discuss after this podcast is over. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you so much for coming on the AFC podcast. But before you go, I always end this uh, every show with this one segment. It's called The Right Words at the Right Time. And uh, I got this... Uh, idea after reading this book called the right words of the right time i think her, uh, the author's name at the time was marlo thompson and i can never remember her name and i apologize marlo if that's your real name i'm sorry <laughs> anyway um in my early days i was reading this book and it was basically just a collection of interviews of well-known celebrities athletes politician renowned household names that you would actually hear and see like even today but before they became them there was always that moment where it pretty much was that right words at the right time moment where they were all given something to just have them keep moving forward to overcome every obstacle to separate the days of this to that so my question is to you joe barra has anybody ever given you the right words at the right time that have always stuck with you that helped you get over any obstacle that was ever in your way for better or worse, or 
Are there any words of your own that you would like to share? Wow, that's deep. <laughs> um, you know, the one thing that sticks out to me that I can think just right now off the top of my head, it was once again, peak breakup at my lowest point when I was still in this new faithful journey. And a pr the priest was talking and these words resonated. I believe it's Matthew 29, 20, where Jesus says, I am with you always. For some reason, when I heard that, I started bawling. This was probably, when I say peak breakup, this is like a year afterwards, but still hurt. Realizing that I'm never alone. Realizing that when you've accepted Christ in your life, he's always with you at your highs and at your lows. And then realizing that I have the best companion of my life that's always with me, who's always going to love me and be there for me. It hit me like a lightning bolt. And even and another one, whenever even I'm in the gym struggling or when I was on Randall's Island on Tuesday, struggling to get my mile and a half time in under 12 minutes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I live my life by those two verses. Amen and amen, brother. And that's not bad if you could do two miles under 15 minutes, let alone a mile and a half under 12. That's actually I did, pretty decent. I, I did the mile and a half in 11 minutes and 23 seconds, which was an improvement from last time. So I'm proof it's working. It's awesome, man. Did you have to eat your own protein bars or did you kind of stray away? Oh, no. afterward, I took my, um, I took all Max's A cuts before. And then afterwards I had two servings of chocolate protein. It was delicious and very much needed. Maybe we should put together a 5K on Randall's Island because uh, I know the people down there and that'd be actually a pretty cool spot to do a 5K and uh, try to like raise awareness for the AFC and all that stuff. Oh, sign me up. I am down. Yeah, It'll be great be training. Sick. Yeah, I would love, I would probably, ju I can't actually do the 5K because of my back because I did That's a right, job. I'll do it. back went out for two weeks, but oh my God. I, I will run win. for you. You sit and watch. I, I did win once 10, 10 or 15 years ago, my category of uh, 3K. Or no, it was a 5K. It was like three miles and change or whatever. I placed first in my category and it was like uh, under, I think it was like under half hour or something like that. I know it was under 30 minutes for a 5K, but to place first in my category, no training whatsoever. I'm like, yes, did it. It was awesome. Wow. Nice. But dude, not a, not a flex, but just one of those moments where it's like, if you need a win in your life, just keep moving. Brother, you organize that. I'm there. All right, that we'll we'll get on that next summer, especially after the festival. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe Giuseppe Bibera, the Italian stallion himself who lives here in the Hudson Valley. You know how to contact him at Joe J Bera on Instagram. Joe, brother, like uh, it's so it's so it's such a relief for me to actually find somebody else who's a Christian because being a Christian just for me is just really not hard, but it gets so fucking lonely when you think you're the only one. Amen, my friend, and that's why. God has you at the right place at the right time for the right person. That's why I believe I'm so glad we met. I believe it was a divine yeah, meeting. Man. And everyone come, listening, come. just wait to see what happens in the next couple of years, where yeah. this friendship's going to, what it's going to spawn. Because I'm declaring it right now. You're going to see the good things that are going to come to this. Amen. I received that. And I'm actually double downing and saying, yes, I agree. Let's do it. Should have actors and faith podcasts and just have Christians come right. on the podcast, just actors of faith where it's like navigating. Well, that's the AFC podcast, but maybe we could have you as a co-host and bring that element in. Oh, that sounds awesome. I'm down. Actually, that why not? That would actually <laughs> yeah. be pretty cool. I'm doing I've been doing this podcast alone. Might as well why, why not have just like two two dudes? Why not? If why not? um Girls Gone Bible can do it, why can't guys I, go? I don't know what the alternative to that guys is. Guys gone God? No. Guys gone God. No, yeah, <laughs> that sounds horrible. Would, actors in faith, AFC podcast. Like honestly, I think no names, no labels. Just, yeah. just be, just honestly, be your false trust God's timing. Absolutely. But yes, yeah, uh, shout out to well, of course, GGB. Shout out, well, to Aaron, your boy. Shout out to the AFC, and uh, definitely see you guys at the Hutsy mashup at the RMW Cellars in West Park, New York, on the twelfth. Joe Barra, God bless you, and I will leave you with this: wherever you go and all that you do, always remember to never forget community, creativity, and joy. 
Amen to that, man. God bless. Thank you. God bless. We'll see you on the next one, buddy. See you next week. See ya. Ciao.